podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks, coast to coast, on Saturday, December 4th, 2021. This is episode 1,849. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Start or advance your IT career with the wonderful instructors of IT Pro TV. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription, just use the code TWIT30 at checkout. And by userway.org. Userway ensures your website is accessible, ADA compliant, and helps your business avoid accessibility-related lawsuits. The perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. It's not only the right thing to do, it's also the law. Go to userway.org slash twit for 30% off Userway's AI-powered accessibility solution. And by AT&T. It's 2021. There are self-driving cars, plant burgers, tourists in space. The least your phone could do is stream without lag. You should get AT&T 5G. AT&T 5G is fast, reliable, and secure. It makes downloading entertainment, staying connected, and protecting your device easy. Make sure your phone service keeps up with what you need from it. Get AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires a compatible plan, may not be in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Well, hey, 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 how are you today, honey? Honey child, it's me, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, augmented reality, virtual reality, real reality. I introduce to you the man in charge of real reality here, Micah Sargent, <laughs> boy genius. Hello. Tech guy junior joining us. As he does these days and Saturdays, I don't know. I guess you just don't have anything else to do. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here to help us out. So the NSO group, bunch of spooks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean that in the nicest way. They're spies. They're agents. It's a, comp it's a company that, uh, Israeli company that collects bugs the kinds of bugs that let bad guys get into your, you know, phone or your computer without your knowledge, we call them exploits because they exploit you. And these, uh, they collect these exploits, but they, but they have a very keen eye for exploits. What they really want is exploits they can sell on to governments to hack people's devices to spy on them. Mm -hmm. The NSO group. Now, the NSO group says, well, we don't sell it to repressive regimes. We only sell it to the good guys. Except uh, they sell it to Turkey, which is somewhat repressive. Bahrain. Which is some, and then these gov these governments use it to spy not on terrorists. You know, that's what they say. Well, we're going to prevent terrorism. I'm all for that. Prevent terror. But they also spy on journalists who say bad things about the government. And they also spy on activists who are agitating in the government. You know, you you know, it depends on your point of view. You could call them terrorists, I guess. Mm -hmm. They're activists. The government doesn't like them. So the NSO group uh, collects these from hackers. Hackers have a choice. You know, when you find a bug in software, you you there's a lot of things you can do with it. The the worst thing you could do with it is just publish a blog post and say, I found this bug. Because then that's telling the world uh, that's not a good thing. Mostly what you want to do, ideally, is tell the company that made the software. Let's say you find a bug on the iPhone that allows a bad guy to send you a text message that, with that, you know, you open it and you go, I don't know what that is, and that's it. And then by virtue, pure virtue of opening that text message, the bad guy now can get into your phone and read your messages and see what you're doing. That would be bad, right? That's an exploit. Um you, if you discovered an exploit like this, you'd have some choices. You could settle, go to Apple and say, hey, I found a problem. It's called responsible disclosure. Generally, when companies that do this, you know, security researchers do this, they say, you have 90 days to fix this problem. Eventually, I'm going to have to go public because I, I don't want people to get, you know, exploited. 
So if you don't fix it, I'm going to tell them. But the companies usually say, oh, good, good, thank you. Not only will we fix it, but here, here's some money for your efforts. You know, 10000 20000 They call it a bug bounty. And there are a lot of people out there who make uh, their living searching for these flaws, these exploits, and then selling them to Apple. Problem is, Apple doesn't pay quite as much money as some other people. <laughs> there are some other legitimate groups, usually uh, funded by uh, companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft, uh, that will buy them. Zerodium is one of them. And they'll then pass it on to the company, and then they'll reward the hacker, and this is a way to make a living. But then there's this NSO group. And if you've got something, this what I just described was what they call a zero-click exploit on the iPhone. If you've got something that will let m me send you a message and then put stuff on your iPhone that can spy on you, ooh, that's valuable. And they will pay millions to this hacker. Hmm, I can get 50000 from Apple. I can get a million and a half from the NSO group. Now, Apple's going to not do anything bad with it. They're going to fix it. NSO group, the reason they could pay you so much is because they're getting paid that much by governments for these exploits. Now, I understand, you know, a lot of hackers say, well, I'm going to take the million and a half. The problem is now the NSO group sells this on to governments. Apple doesn't like this. Apple, in fact, uh, last week sued the NSO group because the way they this, this particular exploit works is the NSO group sends the message to, let's say, uh, Micah, let's say you're an activist trying to take down the tech guy regime. <laughs> so I say, well, I'm not going to, we will not have that. I'd like to get into his phone and find out what he's up to. So I send a uh, million dollars to the NSO group. They say, okay, we're going to open the door to Micah's phone. What you do with it is up to you. They send a message to Micah's phone, as NSO group does. It hacks your phone, and then they give me <laughs> access to your phone. Apple says that's a violation of our terms of service. They're creating message, iMessage accounts for, under false pretenses to hack phones, and they sued them. Facebook has sued them. Uh, they appealed, and Facebook won again in, 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 uh, super, in uh, that Superior Court. Uh, so... Uh, this is interesting. Now, the reason I bring this up, so you understand what the NSO group does, they collect these um, malicious exploits and sell them off to the to governments, and then they say, well, we only sell it to good governments, except they'll send it to any government. Well, and I'll give you an example. Apple has just revealed that the NSO group, an Israeli company, has hacked the smartphones of a number of State Department employees using the NSO Group's software. Uh, they call it Pegasus, by the way, just in case you, just for your, you know, when you're at a cocktail party, somebody says Pegasus, now you'll know what that is. The U.S. The US State Department. Okay, this is bad now. Now we're talking, uh, now we're, so I had always assumed somewhat that, um, that the uh, U.S. government probably used NSO to spy on terrorists, right? Maybe not. Maybe not. According to uh, people familiar with the matter, this is a story from Reuters, Apple iPhones of at least nine U.S. State Department employees were hacked by an unknown assailant. I like that use of the word assailant. Un unknown assailant using sophisticated spyware developed by the NSO group according to four people familiar with the matter. The hacks, which took place in the last several months, hit U.S. officials either based in Uganda, ah, or focused on matters concerning Uganda. Ah, maybe now we know who paid the NSO group to get into those guys' phones, Uganda. The intrusions represent the widest known hacks of U.S. officials through NSO technology. Reuters could not determine who launched the latest cyber attacks, but the tech guy says it was Micah, or no, it was Uganda. <laughs> Uganda. Um, NSO Group said in a statement on Thursday, they did not have any indication their tools were used, but canceled access for the relevant customers. <laughs> How much longer is NSO going to be around, do you think? <laughs> 
because they're starting to be at the center of all of these different lawsuits and all of this attention that's being paid to them. A couple of months ago, the United States issued sanctions against the NSO group, which really irritated the Israelis mm -hmm. who said, well, wait a minute, this is an important company for our economy. How dare you? Well, I think we know how dare we. Um, the NSO group says, if our investigation shall show these actions indeed happened with NSO's tools, such customer will be terminated permanently and legal actions will take place. Oh, please. Officials at the Uganda embassy in uh, Washington, D.C. had no comment. Apple had no comment. A State Department spokesperson had no comment. But uh, the NSO group is on the Israeli entity list. Sanctions making it harder for U.S. companies to do business with them. This is the world we're in right now. And we, you know, we often talk about securing your phone and so forth. And I want to make this really clear. Nobody is pen spending a million and a half bucks to hack into your phone. Yeah. Or my phone. Well, maybe mine. I don't know. No. No one is. Or Micah's phone. Well... These exploits, the problem is they're worth a lot of money. And if you use them too much, they'll be discovered and fixed. Apple will fix them. So you really want to use them surgically, carefully. And you have to have some money. That's often a government that will pay to do this. So now, now you know if you hear you're at a cocktail party and you hear about NSO Group. That's what they do. That's what Pegasus is. And Apple's suing them. Facebook's suing them. U.S. government is sanctioning them. However, they're still at it. They're still at Unless it. Unless you're at a fantasy cocktail party about unicorns and magical horses. In yeah. which case, Pegasus would be... That's a different Pegasus. Yeah, so, you know, That's just, the one I just don't want wings. people to be embarrassed, you know, if they're at that kind <laughs> oh, of cocktail Oh, I know party. all about that. No, we're talking about the one with wings. <laughs> That's a good point. I should uh, really qualify. Horse cocktail parties are out of the question. Yeah, no, but, but if you're talking amongst sophisticates, technical sophisticates... Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting world we live in. And I, again, I want to emphasize, you're, normal people, you and I are not uh, targets, but dissidents, journalists, maybe. Uh, if you were writing a story that Uganda didn't like, guess what? Or if you were a State Department uh, person who was uh, doing something Uganda didn't like, guess what? So, And by the way, uh, it is possible to discover these hacks if you send the phone to Apple. They can figure it out. But otherwise, you wouldn't know. Your phone would you just be operating completely normally. Our show today, brought, we're going to talk, uh, take some phone calls in just a little bit. 8888-ASK-LEO. The website is techguylabs.com. Uh, we have extra time this hour because Scott Wilkinson is taking the week off. So our home theater geek won't be here. That means more calls for you. 8888-ASK-LEO. When you hear something on the show, techguylabs.com is the place to go. It'll all be there. How are you, Micah? I am doing peachy keen. I saw you got to go to SF for your birthday. Oh, did you see that? Oh, you should go. I think you would enjoy this. Okay. Have you ever been to the De Young or Big Museum in Golden Gate Park? <gasps> okay, you guys should go down there. There's a science museum, which is great. I'm already on board. Yeah. <laughs> and then next to it's the art museum. And right now, because I know you love fashion. I just look at your stripey outfit and I can sell it. <laughs> right now at the De Young, there's, and let me see how long it's going to go on. There's a special exhibit of um, the fashion designer. What's his name? Patrick Kelly. Do you know who he is? Patrick Kelly. Oh, he was so great. Anyway, all of his clothes, he's passed away, uh, but he was just this brilliant guy. Uh-huh. And there's all the clothes are there, and then they sh and they have the f videos of the runway. Oh, neat! It's really I think you would enjoy it. Plus, the art is great. Lots of good art of all kinds. And then next door, um, the science museum. I think you would, and it's beautiful. It's in a beautiful building. It's Golden Gate Park. See, fashion museum would be more for Sebastian. I would be at the side. Like, yeah, we would get something good. out of it. I could. Go but he the likes. Place. He's more into fashion than you are. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You're just so fashionable. I thought you oh, must be that's interested. Very kind. Patrick Kelly is really amazing. He died in 1990 at a very young age. It was very sad. Oh, yeah. I'm looking at some of the fashion now. It's really fun. It's fun. And it's fun. He was black. He moved to Paris because of prejudice. He grew up in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Oh, wow. Uh, and was beloved in Paris, had his fashion house in Paris. And he, one of the things he did that was kind of controversial, he collected like icons of racism. I see that, yeah. And then would incorporate it into his uh, fashion, which makes it so much fun. 
Yeah, I love the idea. I wonder how of long that's going to be there because draining the power from those. Things yeah, that's what's his point them. exactly. And then Judy Chicago is there too. There's a Judy Chicago retrospective, which I I love her stuff. But um, so fun. Yeah, it doesn't say when this leaves, but the De Young's worth a trip. And then yeah, we went to the best restaurant. Oh my god! What uh, what type of cuisine? <sighs> Farm to table. Ooh. But very haute cuisine. It was oh, really? a yeah prefix, like nine courses. It was really incredible. That's awesome. Oh, my God. And it was tiny, seven tables. Oh, my and goodness. you sit, we sat, I guess because it was my birthday, they gave us the table of honor. You're looking at the, ki the kitchen's right there. There's six cooks on the line. The line cooks are there. And they make, and I said, is that the kitchen? Because it's tiny. It's big, smaller than this room. And they said, yeah. I said, they make everything there? He said, yeah. So... You watching them prepare it, and then they serve you, which is really cool. Not oh, that's waiters. Neat. So the the, the line dinner. cooks who made it bring it out and put it on your table. So it's really it was wonderful. That's it's cool. a great experience. For sons and daughters, it's called. Sons and daughters, and perfect for you, foodie. Yeah, I'm a foodie. I don't know if you're a foodie, but I'm a foodie. Ladies and gentlemen, the unbreakable phone angel Kim Schaffer. Kimmy, don't take no Schaffer. Hello, Kim. Good uh, day. Good day. <laughs> good day, sir. I good, day. good day. Good day, sir. Uh, great. How'd you go? How'd you, did you have a good week? I did. Yeah. Very busy, but good. Yeah. yeah. And happy birthday to you. Well, uh, you, you know, uh, my birthday was last week. Do you feel older? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> it was one of those birthdays where you look yeah. at it and you go, you are now old. But uh, it comes with its benefits, though, doesn't it? <laughs> if you consider Medicare a benefit, <laughs> yes, I think so. Yes. You know, the benefit is you're still alive. Yes. That's the benefit. And healthy. And healthy. Yeah, thank goodness. Knock, knock on, knock on my mouse pad. Um, but uh, somebody told me they took my birth date out of the Wikipedia entry. You have two years what? on your birthday. <laughs> So two, two Wikipedia, you're you bet not. You were born twice. I don't know. It was. It's like this year, comma this year, because they were just saying they didn't know, and it was like, well, now I know. They which. used to know. Somebody better update for a long page. time. It says 1955 or 1956. Yeah, that's strange. <laughs> and they took the birthday out. Um, but see, the point of all of this is, I don't edit my. You're not supposed yeah, to you're touch. Not supposed to edit your, yeah, that's... I know what my birthday is, and I could go in there and fix it, but you're not allowed to. Oh, you can't. I mean, do you want to say on your for own the record? Behalf? <laughs> no, you can't. But you somebody can. else can. But I can say for the record, November 29th, 1956, if anybody wishes to fix it. There you go. <laughs> but I don't really pay that much attention to it. It's it's mostly right. But not sometimes there's strange stuff in there. Because, you know, with Wikipedia, you know, you get people going in and oh, yeah. messing Making with it and edits, stuff. Yeah. Making changes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm glad I don't have a Wikipedia page. I knew you had two two <laughs> dates because I was trying to remember which of the days was your birthday so I could send you a text on the right day. You did. And I when I went there, uh, it said this year, comma, this year. And I thought, That's, so I wonder why they don't know. <laughs> they used to. What's really strange, they used to know. So I don't understand how that um, changed. It came from a New York Times cover story. Plug in, boot up, feel free to melt down. <laughs> <laughs> I like the title. Yeah. I, uh, feel free to melt down. Very odd. Oh, this is a story the New York Times did in 2003. Oh, I thought it was about Y2K. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, feel free to melt down. So that's down. their reference. You know, you have to have a reference. So that's the reference. Anyway, hello, Kim. Hi. Who should I talk to first? Um, well, let's go to Chime, because I like the name. I love the name. <laughs> Line one, Chime. Sounds it's like an internet Oaks. startup, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah. it does. Thank you, Kim. Hi, Chime. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, good after 11 there, Leo. Good after 11. See? Perfect. Yeah. That's right. Perfect. Well, that's why not right. Be specific, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, next Tuesday, we're getting our first ATSC 3.0 TV station here in L.A., and I need a tuner, but here, but some odd uh, things. I first of all, I need one with text to speech, and um, preferably with RCA jacks because I have an older setup in the bedroom. I don't need to replace my Insignia TV in the living room because it's working fine. It, uh, I just want to get the 3.0 content in case there's something that's not on the um, 1.0. On Tuesday, December 7th, a day that will live in infamy. That's right. KTTV, channel, what is that, channel 11, 7? 11. 11, that's right. Oh, you, found, you found it real fast, huh? Yeah, well, 
This is something I should be talking about. We have a big audience on KFI in Los Angeles, so mm -hmm. I guess I should. Well, I'm listening on the HD2 stations because I can't bear to listen to analog AM anymore. So ATSC3 is kind of like that. Actually, there's a. It's analogous to the analog. <laughs> uh, the ATSC is the is broadcast television's response to internet, and because they want to be able to do more with their broadcast signal, and yeah. among other things, they hope to do add interactivity, which will require the internet. Uh, it's going to give them, like it did with radio, it's going to give them extra side channels. And it's really going to come down to whether you want it or whether it'll be worthwhile what the TV channel does with it. There's no uh, standard way to implement it. I like the fact that, you know, if there's an emergency, uh, you know, a weather thing, that if it doesn't concern my area, they don't have to interrupt my uh, viewing. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's nice. Is that what KTTV says they're going to do? Because no, no, well, no, I'm not. I, I, there's capabilities, but whether they're going to do it or not is unclear. Mm. By the way, there is a public service announcement with this. Yes. You, they're going to change. This means their frequencies are going to change, and you're going to have to rescan. So if you have one of those TV sets uh, that you scanned all the available channels, if you have an over-the-air TV set or over-the-air yeah, tuner, my, my insignia, uh, I and um, I get a hundred scanned. One hundred and eighty-eight channels yeah. here in Sherman Oaks. So you're going to have to rescan after December seventh, after ten a.m. Pacific, <laughs> and then it'll still be channel eleven. And if you have an ATSC three point oh tuner, and a lot of TVs are coming out now with ATSC three, this is one really I should get Scott on, uh, but he's not here this week. If you had that kind of tuner, you you would get perhaps you would get other things. But again, this is completely up to channel eleven. Yeah, but, I, but where do I find a tuner that will meet? Yeah, I see your specs. I have no idea. Yeah, I, I mean, what, no I, what, I, what I've been using since 2005 is a Samsung SIRT451, but uh, it's out of date. I, you know, you can look on uh, Amazon and see there are some ATSC3 tuners. No idea if they'll f fit your needs. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Um, the good news is... They, they're, um, some of them are as little as 25 bucks. So um, it's just going to depend. We interviewed, uh, Chime, we interviewed um, somebody from Sinclair at CES 2020, mm -hmm. almost two years ago, them about the ATSC3 transition. Oh. <laughs> and then... And then the boss came and said, you can't use that, but it's all wrong. <laughs> so I am a little confused about what will happen. My sense is it's really going to very much depend on uh, what the what Channel 11 does with it, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is it may not be worth it to to run out and, and, and find this. But I do see some very inexpensive, the GE extendable bar TV antenna. Supports ATSC 3.0. Well, you'd need a tuner, wouldn't you? Yeah, and the ATSC website itself, ATSC.org, has some uh, pages on its news news blog that have some suggestions. That I, I see lots of different uh, news releases talking about tuners that support it. There's also a, a site, Tom's Guide, which you may be familiar with. They do some reviews. That has a roundup of, of yeah. ATSC devices, uh, ATSC 3.0 devices. So there are a few sources that will kind of collect the ones, and that way you can compare between them, because it sounds like that's what you're wanting to make sure that you can get that VGA connection that you're looking for without having to make that upgrade. Yeah, you know, I wrote to uh, Zapper Box, and I, I asked them about text-to-speech, and they said that it, they thanked me. They said they'd look into it. So. Ugh, great. Ah. Yeah, so you're blind? Yes. Yeah, so that, yeah, I mean, obviously it's unusable if you if you don't have text-to-speech on there. Um, I, again, <laughs> I don't know, you know, given what I've seen about ATS-3, it's very confusing what benefits you're going to have and whether it's going to be anything you really even want. And as I said, uh, there's a standard, but what the TV channel does with that is you know you don't know has channel 11 said what they're going to do I, I i don't know i mean i've seen on the avs forum there's people talking about what channel numbers and who's going to piggyback off it and everything like that so that's how i know about this um fox 11 atsc plans let's see if they i mean all i all i found was that psa that i that i mentioned their 30-day notification Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they're putting that on your on your TV too, but um, 
I don't see them saying, oh, yeah, what we're going to do is two side channels. Because they can do so. You get a more bandwidth. So you could do 4K, for instance, with ATSC, mm -hmm. but three. But maybe they won't. <laughs> well, well, right, now, right now, channel 11 has, uh, I think it goes up to 11.4. And then 13 takes up some of it. I think 13 is also Fox owned and they have some more bandwidth than right. it does. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you, it sounds like you you just like it. You just want to have it because you need it because it's the latest, greatest well, thing. Yeah, and, and also <laughs> there might be more sub-channels or something else. I mean, There might be is the yeah. one. Yeah, the might, yeah, there might be. Um, let me see. Yeah, see, I can't. I, I wish I could. Oh, here it is. That's No, that's. Yeah, I'm looking at their uh, Fox 11s. Oh, no, this is from WLUK. This is a different Fox 11. So, uh, and they, even this guy who's been doing it for longer, they're in uh, uh, Detroit, I think. They even they don't say what they're doing with it. Mm. So yeah, I don't. You know, I don't know. Um, maybe somebody listening will will call in. You you know what I would do is call Fox Eleven, and and they'll put you on with their engineer, and uh, and you can say here's what I want to do, and they maybe their engineer will know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I would, you know, this is a very bumpy rollout, much like HD radio was. It took years for HD radio to actually become anything. Well, you know, the shame of it is before I had an HD radio, there were a lot of AM stations here that had it on. Now all of them except for 1260 have turned it off. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, exactly. And, I, mean, I wish I had it. I mean, but back then there were no uh, uh, portables with batteries. There was some reason about that, you know. Yeah. I have to run, Chime. Nice to talk to you. Let, keep listening. Maybe somebody will come up with an answer. That's the real hope of this show, because I can't answer that one. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We were talking with Chime about ATSC 3.0, which is the spec for what they call a next-gen <laughs> TV. And you understand what's going on. The broadcast channels are struggling against Internet television, right? More and more people are saying, well, I don't need... I don't need the broadcast uh, channels. I just want to watch my uh, Netflix or my HBO Max or my Amazon Prime or maybe I'll watch uh, YouTube TV. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, the prices for things like Hulu. Hulu's price just went up, uh, the Hulu streaming portion. So did YouTube TVs. They're 65 bucks a month. YouTube TV went up again? No, no, that. but that's a few months ago. Oh. 65 bucks a month, which is what you pay for basic cable, right? Mm -hmm. And the and the primary reason for these price hikes are these locals coming to them and saying you need to pay us more, because they're really saying you know the future is probably over the internet, but this ATSC three I think or next gen TV is this kind of last gasp attempt to stay kind of hip with the youngs, but no young is going to go to a special antenna, a TV tuner that can handle ATSC. For something that is less than internet. Right. Especially because they already have internet. internet. So it's to add friction to the yeah. process is not worth it. Yeah. So if you uh, can help Chime, he's looking, because he's blind, he's looking for uh, an ATSC3 tuner. There are lots of them. They're cheap. Um, but he's looking for one that has text-to-speech so that he can, he, he can hear what it's saying. This is channel 11 or whatever. Um, so if you know, call 8888-ASK-LEO. You can also leave a comment on the website, techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. Uh, oh, Vegas Wayne's in the chat rooms in our IRC, irc.twit.tv, saying, why should local channels be able to charge for carriers to take their channel? Oh, don't get me started on the <laughs> FCC's must-carry rules. It's very complicated, but if you want to know more about it, you can Google FCC must-carry rules. This started in 1965, which requires cable systems to carry the local channels, but gives the local channels some rights, and it's, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> it's very complicated. So, uh, in fact, I'll just read the headers from this article uh, in the First Amendment Encyclopedia. Must-carry rules instituted by the FCC in 1965. Appeals court found must-carry rules incompatible with the First Amendment. 
mid-1980s. Congress re-established must-carry rules 1992. Supreme Court upheld the new rules 1993. Must-carry scheme is altering to fit dig digital television 2005. And that's just the first 20 years, 30 years. <laughs> you know, it goes on and on and on. So uh, essentially, a local channel can decide whether they can force the cable companies or YouTube TV to carry it, or they can charge them. And uh, most of them decide, I want to double dip. I'd like, I'm making money on advertising, but I'd also like to make money uh, from the uh, cable company paying for access to Channel 11. <sighs> Truthfully, the best uh, the best deal in uh, television, if you can put an antenna up and get the the big stations from the nearby big city, that's the best deal in television. Probably the highest quality HD as well. And ATSC, Next Gen TV, offers perhaps 4K. Perhaps because it's up to the channel whether they implement it. You know, if there's a television station engineer listening who can explain all this to me, call me. 8888-ASK-LEO. Meanwhile, Trevor, Fort Worth, Texas. Hello, Trevor. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. November 29th, 1956, when you were born and also when my mom was born. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Well, uh, happy birthday, Mom. Yeah, so I have an old Dell 17-inch and uh, I've replaced the fan. I've upgraded the RAM. I've turned the hard drive to solid state. I feel it's time to get another 17-inch laptop I do some video editing from time to time, and I was looking for something that was quiet or fanless. You like a big laptop. Now, there's another way to go, which is to get a quiet, fanless laptop with a smaller screen and attach it to a big monitor, which would get bigger than 17 inches. You could drive a 32 or even a 49-inch monitor with many, many laptops. You don't want to do that? Uh, no, sir. I um, I live here in Fort Worth, but my mom lives in uh, Houston and... Uh, some of our family live in Minnesota and Louisiana, so I travel around often. Yeah, so you want to have a big laptop screen because you want to edit. The problem is almost always when they have screens this big, they are uh, what we call desktop replacements, which means they'll have bigger, uh, you know, faster processors, which means hotter, which means fans. So it's very unusual to see a 17-inch. Dell still sells them, by the way. Uh, the XPS 17, which I really like, and I, I think a lot of times, you're you're gonna, the trade off is power versus battery life, and power versus fans. But let me see. Let's look. Oh, the LG Gram is very lean. I again, I don't know if it has a. So the couple I would look at are the Dell XPS 17, which is very it's it's their ultrabook. It's thin and light, and I would guess it. I'm sure it has a fan. But it may be not such a bad fan. You want it to be quiet. Is that the main reason you don't want a fan? Yes, I um, also teach uh, third grade, and sometimes I make little videos. Oh, uh, and um, that's, that's like nice. uh, you know how to do multiplication or whatever. And then if the fan's really loud, you can hear the fan while I'm recording the video. Yeah, that's annoying, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, let me just look on the uh, XPS. I'm sure, uh, look, anything that's going to have a 17-inch monitor is probably going to have a fan. Um, you might be able to reduce fan noise by getting an i5 instead of an i7. The i7s will always have a fan because they're so darn hot. Let me look uh, at the LG Gram because that that is a very beautiful thin and light. They do make a 17. I really like both the XPS 17 from Dell and the LG Gram. Um, and often when you get really, really thin like this, there's no room for a fan. Uh, it is running Windows 7. Boy, it's so thin. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure about the fan thing. I would, I would recommend either of these. My guess is that, uh, they'll both be pr pretty quiet. Um, because, uh, they're so, let's see, thin and light. And they're not going to want to have a big old fan in a little thin laptop like this. Um, be ideal if you could go in and try it, wouldn't it? Just hear what it sounds like when you crank it up. I would say the Gram is probably the best bet for quiet because it's using, uh, it's not discrete processor. It is using an i7, which is, it's a 10th generation. If you could get the uh, Ice Lake, I'm sorry, the uh, 
what we call the Scalder Lake, the Alder Lake, <laughs> you might you might be able to get it fanless. That's pretty hot too. All of these are so hot. Let me see on the gram. Nobody puts whether they have a fan in here. You like your Dell? I would look at the XPS 17. If you want really thin and light, uh, the LG Gram 17, very nice system. I don't see on the specs whether either one has a fan. I'm looking at the specs. They don't say. I'm going to guess it does. It's rare that you could find a laptop these days without a fan. It would be a much lower power processor. Um, they all have fans. But you want a quiet one, and I think either of those is going to be fairly quiet. And uh, you said, you know, maybe going to i5, would that be a big trade-off in performance for video editing? Yeah, not huge, but yeah. I mean, re you know, look, the reason these fans ramp up is you're doing work. Uh, and, and, and the i7 gets really, really hot. The i5 wouldn't get as hot, but the reason is it's slower. So if you can, I think the thing to do is go to a... Do they still have computer stores? <laughs> go, go to a computer store and, try, and, you know, try something and see if you can get the fan pumped up. I think both of those would be fairly quiet. You're just always going to have a fan on. You always are. I, you know, because you can't make PCs. That's where Apple has a real advantage. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Um, actually, it looks like people are complaining. I'm looking at the chat room in the Dell community that the fans are always on when charging the XPS 17. You got to keep it cool while it's charging. Yeah. So maybe that's not the one. Maybe that's not the one to get. I think if you're doing video editing, you will have to deal with fans at some point. I can't, point. you know, there's there's one Mac that doesn't have a fan. It's a MacBook Air. That's because it's the M1 and it's a cooler processor. And even it can't go at max speed mm -hmm. because it doesn't have a fan. Passive cooling just isn't enough for an Intel chip in general, period. Could video edit on the iPad. <laughs> yeah. Skip the fan altogether. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate sure, it. Sure, hey, I, I appreciate talking to you. That, that sounds like fun making videos for your third grade class. That's awesome. That's really cool. And say hi to your mom. I sure will. Have and a good happy day. birthday. All right, Trevor. Thanks. Yeah, it would be nice if there was a site. Scooter X shared one in the chat, uh, sort of an official site that had, with the laptop reviews, it had fan noise review or a fan noise metric to go along with it. Thank you, Mike B., for fixing my Wikipedia entry. Nice. So they're quoting that Times thing, which said I was 47 in 2003, so they didn't know. Oh. That's why it's either of those years, depending. Yeah, right? what to, yeah when, when during that year. There's no clock? There's, how come my shot doesn't... Oh, the two-shot, because there's no... So they now they want a clock for this shot. Uh, too I, much to ask. Where would I, I could put it over your shoulder. I'll just... Wear a clock over my of face. That. I could flavor flav it, it and wear a clock around my neck. Here. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, we do. Yeah, get it. Let's get a. Uh, do we have anything? Oh, maybe you could put that um, that clock that's over in the end of the room over there. But then you wouldn't have it. Get a clock. Get get a clock. Yeah, a little grandfather oh, clock. Be It'd be cute. so cute. Bong <laughs> bong. <laughs> Cuckoo clock. Ooh. Oh, I have that at home, but it, the problem is it does not keep very good time. <laughs> I can br I'll bring the gear clock in. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That's a good one. Look, Burke already has a clock, and that's a that's a wireless radio clock, right? No radio, I don't think. Oh, oh, I have one like that that has a radio in it. I guess you could set it. That's what you have to do with all these clocks. I was thinking put a lanyard on it and Mike could just. Yeah, I'll just wear yeah. it around my neck. Like yeah, like Flav of Flav. Yeah. Um, also, I did know Monterey has been a built-in internet speed test. That's what I was responding to when I said, yes, I've added it to my Emacs. Because uh, there is a uh, Emacs uh, package with OS X extensions. And among other things, <laughs> it allows you to call from Emacs the internet speed test. So, yes, I did know that, as a matter of fact. I'm running the test. Yep. 368 down, 160 up. I'm not really sure why they put that in, but... Oh, yeah, maybe... Uh, maybe. Do you think uh, Roberto used uh, Pegasus to... <laughs> to did, I, did you hear that story? No. I what? mentioned it on Twig. 
So Roberto Hellman, I'm lying in bed on my birthday on Monday, and my Alexa goes, Bloop, you have a message from Roberto Hellman, and it starts playing a birthday message. <sighs> Uh, how did you do that, Roberto? Oh, that's kind of terrifying. <laughs> it was cute. It's, it's a very cute message. So I did, but it was just it was strange. Yeah, I came out of nowhere. I don't know how he figured that out. I, I does Roberto Hellman have your contact information? Probably, yeah. I think if you whatever, because I've used that service before and then stopped using it because I found it too it scares people. Abrupt, yeah, yeah, cuts into people. But yes, yeah. there's like a messaging system. Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> it was so cute. I'll play it for you. It was really cute. Our show today brought to you by IT Pro TV. What a great place to be studying IT. And IT is, it's a great time to be in IT. Talk about job openings in all areas, you know, desktop support, uh, security, networking. I just saw the other day, 1.4 million open jobs for network security experts. That's the kind of thing you can learn at IT Pro TV. Start or advance your IT career. If you're looking to break into one of the many IT careers out there or you're already a seasoned IT professional, IT Pro TV has something for every one of you. If you just start now, you'll get the certificates you need to get that first job. In fact, they're an official partner of CompTIA, which means they're the best place to get your A+, plus or your Security+, plus, your Network+, plus certificate. Those are frequently the certificates employers are looking for for your first IT job. And if you're already in IT, getting recertified may be very important, but just also getting new skills. And IT Pro TV makes it easy. They are always up to date. Seven studios running full-time Monday through Friday means that they're constantly creating content. Why? Well, the exams change, the questions change, software versions change. There's new certs. MCA SE just got replaced by the Azure certs. So they're always making new content with their... Very entertaining, but also very smart edutainers. It's great because when they make something in the, in the studio, it goes from live, and you can watch them do it live, by the way, just like us, and there's a chat room and everything. It goes from live until the library, into their library and within 24 hours. So it's, you know, right there, 5,800 hours of on-demand training at IT Pro TV. Just incredible. And they chunk it up, too, into 20 and 30-minute chunks so you can watch it at your lunch hour, watch it at your convenience, and then get these skills. This month, Python month. I know you want to learn Python. IT Pro TV is focusing on Python for December. Webinar coming up on the 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Most in-demand IT jobs for 2022. That's with one of their edutainers, Ronnie Wong. I love Ronnie. You won't want to miss that. Then uh, next weekend, December 11th and 12th, their free weekend Featuring courses, Introduction to Programming Using Python, Python Programming, Object-Oriented Python, Python Data Model, Python for Security. I think this is a great skill that goes along with all the other things they teach. Take advantage of this. In fact, I think you should start or advance your IT career by becoming a member with their great instructors, itpro.tv slash twit. You'll get an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions as long as you stay active when you use the code TWIT30, TWIT30. That's a good, really good deal. ITPro.tv slash TWIT. The offer code TWIT30 gives you 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV. Build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. It's fun. It's great. And you're going to love your new IT career. ITPro.tv. Go to ITPro.tv slash TWIT. Twit. We thank him so much for supporting the tech guy. Thank you for supporting the tech guy by using that address. That way they, they say, oh, they watched it on the tech guy. ITPro.tv slash twit. Stuck in the studio with you, Leo Laporte, the tech guy, Micah Sargent, tech guy junior. We're answering your questions and calls and thoughts at 8888-ASK-LEO, the website techguylabs.com. We are going to make a change to techguylabs.com. It turns out it's running, boy, this goes back a few years. It's running on a, a, a content management system called Drupal, D-R-U-P-A-L, which I love. In fact, I started using Drupal back in the, the 2000s. Uh, as a journalist, very familiar with Drupal. Yeah, yeah. Lots of CMSs. Uh, like the, the White House for a while, whitehouse.gov, ran on Drupal. I don't think it still does. But it, it's equivalent of WordPress or Squarespace. It was a content management system, and we use it for a long time. We got uh, the techguylabs.com was designed by a company that 
a really great company called Lullabot, and they did a great job running it on Drupal, but it's an old version of Drupal. And unfortunately, it's kind of like running a website on Windows XP. <laughs> the Drupal folks are saying, yeah, uh, we're going to put out the new version, Drupal 9, it's already out, and we're going to stop supporting, I think we're running a Drupal 5 or something, we're going to stop supporting that in uh, next year. And that means it might be a hazard <laughs> on the internet. And uh, so we went back and forth. We talked to the company that uh, maintains it for us. And they said, hey, yeah, well, we could fix that. We'll just upgrade it about a quarter million dollars. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to, we already have another site uh, for the podcast network, twit.tv. And in fact, this show is a podcast on that network. Uh, so what we're just going to do is fold. You'll still go to techguylabs.com, but it'll look different because we're going to fold it into the existing uh, Twit website and shut down the old Drupal site because it just won't be safe to use anymore. So just a, a heads up, a word of warning. Some things are going to, we're not going to have as many features as we, I don't think we'll have commenting. I don't think we have that capability. Uh, but we will, the fundamental show notes, the links and so forth, and video and audio from the show and all that will still be there. So just a heads up. That's going to happen in a couple of weeks. Uh, we decided before the end of the year to decommission it. Yes. The end of life of Drupal is was November 2nd. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, so, yeah. So that's um, so that's why we're, um, we're just going to decommission the thing. We're still getting security updates, but it, that won't last forever. So it's like we're using Windows XP. You just kind of at some point have to move on Gotta except go. i don't i don't want to buy windows 11 for a quarter of a million dollars so we're just gonna <laughs> we're yeah. just gonna uh, punt and to reiterate you can still type in techguylabs.com that will still work to where you need to get yes yeah, so i'm gonna keep saying techguylabs.com and what that will do is take you to the current episode which is great and you'll be able to uh, get all the information you want there uh oh mike b has to fix our wikipedia entry <laughs> thank you november 29th mike b not that i care it probably is just as bad to tell somebody to fix your Wikipedia page as it is to fix it yourself. Maybe, maybe there's a maybe, what is that called? It's a it's a party foul, but I don't think it's. I could just hint. Yeah, hint, <laughs> hint. Gee, it's too bad my Wikipedia site has the wrong birthday, November 29th, 1956. <laughs> too bad it's wrong. <laughs> Such a shame. Such a shame. <laughs> Uh, let's go back to the phones. Uh, Ron's on the line from Yakima, Washington. Hey, Ron. Uh, good morning. Good morning to you, sir. You said on the show that you use your Google Nest Hub to show pictures. So I purchased the Nest Max. Yes. I have many trips in Windows Movie Makers, which, when loaded to Google Photos, will not show on the Nest, and many won't even show up. So I went directly to OneDrive where they play, but only for 11 minutes, short of showing all the slides. Any suggestions on how to fix? Yeah, I mean, I th uh, I don't actually play back movies on my Nest Hub Mac, so I don't know what format it's wanting. It, obviously, if it'll play back in Google Google Photos, it will work. So the so let's say let's forget this Nest Hub Max, which by the way is a great photo frame. I just have it picking up photos uh, from Google Photos, and the nice thing is you can say I only want pictures with my wife, me, or my kids, and then that way it's just family photos. I don't see a lot of random photos from my trips and travels or receipts or you know menus, the kinds of things I take pictures with on my smartphone. So that's a nice feature. I don't know how you play movies back. Maybe you figured that out. But let's see if we can get it working in Google Photos. Probably the problem is the format that Windows Movie Maker saves in is Microsoft's format, an AVI file. And that's probably just not compatible. So what you need to do is something called transcoding it. This is a term that's used uh, by uh, video folks, taking it from one compression format to another compression format. And I'm going to guess that the best compression format for the Google Photos would be either MP4 or the new high-efficiency video codec, MP5. So how do you transcode it? All right, well, you've got the, you've got the AVI files on your 
Windows laptop. What and you don't I mean, OneDrive doesn't matter because you want Google Photos to see it. That's why that's how you get in the hub. So what you need to do is transcode it. There's a free program that does a great job on transcoding called Handbrake. It's uh, free. It's Handbrake B R A K E, like the handbrake in your car. Dot F R. It's a. Uh, it was written by French schoolboys, and uh, you think I'm kidding? It really was. <laughs> well. I think they're college kids, but anyway. Uh, Handbrake will take the AVI format and translate it into something that uh, the uh, Google Photos can read. And I think probably your best bet is uh, MP4. That would be the most compatible, MP4. Uh, and I'm just looking on the Google Photos. Yeah, I guess you can play videos, which is kind of cool. I haven't started doing that, but... Um, It'd be kind of fun to have those motion picture ones in there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but just convert it to a format and then upload it to Google Photos, and they should have no problem playing it back. MP5 is the newest version of video codec. We call it a codec that's short for compression decompression. Uh, so when you, you can't play back uncompressed video in any circumstance. Video's huge. It's so big, no device can play it back. So you have to compress it even, at least a little. Uh, and for playback on phones and uh, laptops and, you know, Google Nest frames, these aren't the fastest processors. It needs to use a codec that they can play back uh, pretty easily because they, the, they aren't big, powerful processors. So, uh, the most popular codec for this is MP4, uh, which has now been kind of supplanted by this high-efficiency video codec, MP5. I bet you Google Photos would take MP5, but just, you know, it'd be safe MP4. The difference is MP5 is a much smaller file. So uh, that's that's where the world is going, MP5. So handbrake.fr, and as I say, we'll put a link in the show notes. Fran on the line from Studio City, California. Hi, Fran, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. You're my last hope. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I spent two hours with Apple support on this problem, and they couldn't fix it. But I'm having a wireless connectivity issue with my mid-2012 MacBook Pro. Uh, the MacBook Pro has a fairly new solid-state hard drive in it. And I'm running Catalina, you know, the latest upgrade of Catalina. Um, I can connect via ethernet directly into my cable modem yeah but wi-fi doesn't work at all it no all my other apple devices in the house you know ipad so airbook most likely things. when you put in that new drive they knocked loose the antenna there's an antenna internal antenna for the wi-fi if that's knocked loose you'll have no signal from wi-fi and if it happens shortly after you put in that ssd that's the best bet go to whoever put it in and say, make sure that antenna, it's just a little connector that goes on the motherboard. Make sure the antenna is connected. I bet it's not. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Four uh, years. So, say again, because I, I had to take a break there. So I didn't hear that oh, last. I'm sorry. Um, the the solid straight hard drive has been in the computer for about four years. But your Wi-Fi so, stopped when? Uh, when we did the when I did the upgrade to Catalina, uh, ten point fifteen point seven. Now it could be a coincidence, but it just happened. Everything was working perfect. So let me ask you some diagnostic questions. I'm sure Apple already asked you this. When you go uh, to the Wi-Fi menu at the top of the screen, Wi-Fi's on, right? Yes. Do you see your uh, Wi-Fi access point? Um, it's my network. Do you see the name of your network underneath that little volcano? Up somewhere? I don't know. What, I have to get a name for what that Wi-Fi logo is, but it's like an upside-down volcano. Underneath right. that, do you see the names of your network? Yeah, I do. You do see it. And then you select it, and the and you're gonna, if you go into network settings, does it say it's on there? Well, here's the weird thing. Uh, using airport utility... Um, the I can see my base station, my airport extreme, everything. That all has a green light. But the internet, the little globe, is um, is orange, mm -hmm. and I cannot connect wirelessly. Right now I'm looking at it, but it, it's because I'm connected uh, via Ethernet. Right. 
Uh, but all my other uh, devices work wirelessly perfectly. Yeah, I don't think it's your, I think it's that laptop, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and uh, do you see, there is, there should be signal strength information on there. Do you see the signal strength? Yeah, it's great. Okay. So then it's not that I was wrong. It's not the antenna. So you're getting a strong signal. You're seeing your base station. But what's happening is it's not connecting. Now, this is going to be a little tricky. But in the network settings, it's going to tell you what your IP address is when you're just on Wi-Fi. Disconnect your Ethernet for a minute. Um, disconnected. Okay. Because we want, to, we want to see what your Internet address is when you're on Wi-Fi. And it's going to be my guess that it's a 169 dot something. Um, wait, okay. wait, wait until it happens. It'll be in the network settings. I'm in the network settings. If when uh, when when you get on a, a Wi-Fi signal, that's just the first part. That's the what's, sometimes they call it the physical layer. That's the connection. But then there's another layer where you actually make a connection to the internet. And if it can't get assigned an address from your router. It will give you a local address, which is a 169 dot something dot something dot something address. Mm -hmm. And that will tell you, ah, I'm not getting an IP address from the router. So that's why I'm asking you that. Yeah. Um, if this is the weirdest thing <laughs> as I'm on here it's with working you now. and I spent two hours with that. It's Apple. working, right? Uh, <laughs> I now have, uh, it says uh, it's connected to my Wi-Fi network. Now, I don't know if I can go online. That's the only thing. I wasn't able to get a web page. Um, yeah, let me see. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> No, uh, this is my magic I mean, touch. This happens to people who do this. Uh, all we have to do is stare at the tech, and then it starts working for people. I've had this happen. No, but then, of, of course, too. as soon as you get off the uh, yeah. call, it'll stop working. So no, actually, I I can't get online. Okay. Okay. So yeah. so, so you tell me again what that IP address is. I'd like to know what that is. Okay. Uh, that would. Okay, I just lost that. Yeah. Um. Okay. It's uh, one nine two one six eight. Okay, that's zero. that is good. So that's good. You're getting from the router. You're getting assigned an appropriate IP address. So that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that you're not getting internet from the router. So now I think it's almost certainly uh, something's broken on the laptop. Oh, um, okay. And, and and what's not broken is hardware, <laughs> so that's the good news because that's the hard thing oh, to fix. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's probably, um, and you're on the 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 Wi-Fi router that you expect to be on and all that. You check that to make sure you're on yours. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. And yeah. you're getting an IP address, so DHCP is working. But Friend, you, you said at one point you connected directly to the modem and uh, you were able to get a signal that way. She's work, Ethernet works. Yeah, but uh, but if yeah. you connected directly to the modem, not through the airport extreme, I've actually done that before. Oh, and yeah, yeah. Mess some things You're up. connecting to the airport extreme, not to the... No, no, I'm not. I'm connecting directly oh, to my you nailed it. modem. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you do that, nothing else will work. <laughs> so... Um, that's interesting. So, that's what you, Apple said. And you have you have an airport extreme. That's your Wi-Fi router that you're using. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a couple of extended. Uh, you know, I had a time capsule, and, it, it, and um, it's an old time capsule working perfectly. Um, but I thought maybe that was the problem. So I disconnected the time. So look capsule. again at your IP address because it shouldn't, if with an airport, it should not be a, a 198. Yeah, okay, usually well, it's a 10. Be 10 dot. Mm -hmm. 10 dot something. Right now in my, um, if I'm looking. Sometimes in, it in takes a while when settings. you disconnect the Ethernet, it takes a while for it to. You know, uh, my larger concern is that the modem might also yeah, does be a your Wi-Fi router. Does your, yeah, my, does your modem... Oh, boy. Yeah, that might be it. Does your So when you say you're connecting the cable modem, mm -hmm. does it have multiple Ethernet ports on it? 
It does. Okay. One is connected to my um, airport extreme. Yeah, yeah. And the other is connected. I, I connected the other one directly to so my laptop. So your internet service provider gives you one address, not multiple ones. So unless you... Uh, and then do you know if you're... Does the internet router... Who's it from, Xfinity? Uh, Spectrum. Spectrum. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's... A, you're right. I wonder if it's a Wi-Fi uh, router. Do you see... I think it's double NAT. Yeah, that's what I'm starting to suspect. So the Wi-Fi that she's connected to is actually from the modem slash router, and it's not going to. Yeah, you want to, um, uh, in your airport extreme settings, you want to okay. put it in something called bridge mode. Bridge? Yeah, there'll be a setting when you go in the airport extreme settings. And I, as I remember, it's been a long time since I've used an airport extreme, but as I remember, it actually says bridge mode. Sometimes they use other names. But what bridge mode will do is it'll say, oh, this spectrum cable modem is the router, not me. Oh. And that could be one of the problems is that you have two routers running. That's why maybe you work when the Ethernet's plugged in because then you're using just one router. Mm-hmm. Uh, so make sure the airport must be in bridge mode for this to work. Um, okay. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm this looking is, at my This is, at this point, this is so, screen. this is so complicated Yeah. that, yeah. uh, it might be difficult for you, for me to ex walk you through it, but, uh, mm. it's in the, so the airport extreme, run the airport extreme software that lets you look at the airport extreme settings. Okay, I'm yeah, I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, yeah. By launching airport utility. I'm I'm on airport utility okay. right now. Okay. Then in network there'll be a router mode under network. I have 20 seconds. And in uh, under there it'll be bridge mode. Turn click that, check that box. Okay. Um yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. She kind of lost me. So, yeah. Fran, if you want to stay on the line after we hop off with you and give Kim your email address, uh, I might be able to reach out a little bit later. Yeah. So if we'll you have do that, Micah, that'll be great. We'll have Micah do the uh, extra. Here we go. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We got your smartphones. We got your smart watches. We got all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, outside that area. You could still call, but you have to use Skype or something like that. Website techguylabs.com will have audio and video from the show in a day or so. It'll also have... Uh, Links, answers to the questions, so you don't have to write anything down. We put it all up there. Thanks to James DeRuvo at techguylabs.com. Manny from Dakota, Minnesota. I like how that rhymes. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Manny. How's it going, Leo? Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. Hey, uh, first of all, thanks for a fantastic job that you and your crew do. I mean, it's very... Very helpful to me, and, and I enjoy your show all the time. Thank you. Your Samsung uh, is telling you you got messages, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it, it would start ringing now. No, oh, that's cute. I love it because you can often tell by the ringtone or the message tone what kind of phone somebody has. What kind of phone? Yeah. I'm, I'm talking to you on my iPhone, yeah. and my Samsung is my backup phone. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just teasing you. I don't mind at all. What can? I, but I, I also mentioned it because if people are listening on the radio and they have Samsung phones, I picked up my phone to see if I was getting a message. So <laughs> that's the other reason. What can we do for you? Well, Leo, um, let's see. You could probably explain this more better than I can, but... You're familiar with the uh, corona mass ejection from the sun, right? Yeah. Solar uh, flares, baby. Yeah, solar flares. Last, I think it was October, we had a pretty big one. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of went, uh, you know, by the wayside there. It didn't hit the earth as strongly as, as some people anticipated. I kind of looked it up, and I didn't realize uh, there's several classes, and the class X is the most dangerous one. Uh, that could really do some damage to our satellites, to yeah. our uh, electronic equipment. And, you know, and I'm wondering, well, you know, if one of those things really hit us, my question to you is what can I do as the average 
Joe to protect, you know, my laptop, my smartphones, and, you know, my electronic equipment? It's a great question. Um, yeah, there was an X1 flare uh, October 28th, just a couple, yes. couple of weeks ago. So um, solar flares eject material from the sun, which continues to fly through the air at the speed of light and eventually hits us. It's such an important thing to pay attention to that actually ham radio operators pay attention to this. They uh, pay attention to what's called space weather. There's even a uh, website, spaceweather.gov, because it definitely affects propagation, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. It affects what you can do as a ham radio operator. So they pay a lot of attention to this. You don't have to really worry about your equipment too much. Because we are, thank goodness, protected by the atmosphere. So most of the damage that would occur from these particles hitting uh, the Earth are kind of mitigated by the atmosphere that it goes through. It is an issue, uh, as you might imagine, for space flight. And in fact, uh, when you send a rocket up, you can't just put a regular old laptop in there. Although I guess Elon is putting iPads in his in his SpaceX capsule. But generally you use for the important mission critical computers, you'll use hardened gear, often very, very expensive and often older processors that are protected against cosmic rays that are actually, that are shielded and they're very expensive. And what NASA does is they do redundancy. So they'll have multiple systems and then they actually have, they take a vote they compare the results of the various systems, and if there's a if they agree, if there's a quorum, they assume that that calculation is correct. If they don't, well, they know maybe they got hit by some cosmic radiation. On Earth, it isn't much of a problem, except, and they mock me when I say this in the chat room, from time to time, on your hard drive, a cosmic particle can hit it and flip a bit. It's just enough energy to turn a one into a zero. And if that one is critical to, say, booting Windows, <laughs> your Windows will stop working. And that is a significant problem on hard drives. What they do to correct it is they have something called ECC error correction. That is, your hard drive actually is suffering errors constantly, thousands of errors all uh, a minute. And the ECC is constantly correcting that. On modern hard drives, the density is so dense. So most hard drives will accommodate these bit flips and fix them. Chances are, it's just like a, a chance of a meteor hitting land. You know, the ocean is a great portion of their surface, so meteorites don't typically, you know, aren't a problem. Uh, it's kind of like that. Your hard drive is a giant ocean of bits, and most of the time, any cosmic damage, cosmic ray damage isn't going to cause a loss of data, partly because of ECC, partly because most of the hard drive is just empty, is seawater. So it's a good question. There's nothing you really need to do. Uh, all modern electronics is built to withstand normal space weather. It's conceivable, I guess, there would be such a massive flare that would cause problems. It probably wouldn't cause a problem with your phone or with your computer. It might cause a problem with infrastructure, things like that. Exactly. But that I, you aren't directly able to help. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sort of I, there's work. nothing really you need to do. Uh, you don't need to go out and get a military spec laptop. You or, mean I shouldn't get like a Faraday cage <laughs> no. pouch for my phone? And in fact, yeah, no. In fact, if you look at the cost of the chips that NASA uses, at least used to use in their uh, space flight, they were, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and they were old chips. But all of this because of the, you know, radiation. It's much worse in space, obviously. Um, I think there is a move afoot to replace your regular RAM memory, you know, these uh, memories that you use uh, in computing with ECC, and I think that's part of the reason. Do the same thing that you do with your RAM that you do with your hard drive, which is check for errors and correct for them before they cause a problem. I suspect, and in fact, Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, made, 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 made some hay about six months ago when he said, no one should be using regular RAM anymore. It's the cause of a lot of errors, computing errors, that we attribute to other things, software um, problems and so forth. He, he says, uh, this was in January, why don't PCs use error-correcting RAM? Because of Intel! 
<laughs> the misguided and backwards policy of consumers don't need error correcting RAM made the market for ECC go away. When you buy a server these days, you can pay a lot more and get ECC RAM. Linus says the arguments against ECC were always complete and utter garbage. Now even the memory manufacturers are starting to do ECC internally because they finally owned up to the fact they absolutely have to. The reason is errors happen. And, and some of it from cosmic rays and particles from solar flares and things like that. Single bit errors. And ECC RAM, just like an ECC hard drive, can correct it. Isn't that interesting? So uh, ECC stands for Error Correcting Checksum. And it's actually a pretty sophisticated but very interesting technology to discover errors and then fix them. So it's a, it's a great question, Manny. Nothing you need to really worry about. I uh, The last time I bought a PC, I investigated buying ECC RAM instead of regular RAM for it. And it was so much more expensive, I decided not to. But there's a school of thought, including Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, who think a lot of the errors that we attribute to bad software or bugs is actually because of RAM that is flipping bits because of solar flares and particles and things like that. Next time, uh, I, yeah, I, I would love to see the industry start moving towards ECC RAM. He says that uh, it's Intel's fault. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it isn't at all. It's all Intel's fault. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll put a link. This is a really good article from uh, January of last year uh, where Linus is, is talking about this issue. 8888 asked, a great question, actually. You know, why, why, why don't these X1 solar flares cause... Problems they probably do, yeah. But we just that we don't see we don't it. notice yeah. it. We just we just don't notice it. Somebody says four bits is a dollar. <laughs> Shave and a haircut. <laughs> I think it's uh, half a dollar. Isn't two bits a quarter? Two bits. I think so. Yes, I am correct. I'm assured by the uh, the pe ear people. The keeper of bits. The keeper of bits. He tells me. Yes. Monetary you're right. bits. Get your motor running. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, heading out on the highway. Micah Sargent's here. We are answering your questions at 8888 Ask Leo. Kelvin on the line from San Diego. It's our blind deaf potter. Hello, Kelvin. Hey, guys. How you guys doing? We're great. Excellent. Come on over. What's up? Uh, I, uh, let me uh, call up the phone. I was trimming some uh, pieces while listening. So, I hope you're set, uh, hope you're getting a lot of people buying your pottery for the holidays. It's going well. And Good. The shipping department is out, out on sea on their cruise, so they got to get back here to <laughs> ship them all out. How dare they? <laughs> How dare the shipping I mean, department go on a cruise this time of year? <laughs> Don't they know? I, exactly. That's what I said. I got to get back here and, and start shipping out. Uh, I mean, I, the Santa Claus is making all the pieces, but the elves left. <laughs> Those elves. They're such slackers. <laughs> <laughs> so what can I do for you, Calvin? So, uh, so on Giving Tuesday, I did a live and... Those that were on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook yeah. got the benefit of hearing my music. Nice. That I had. Liked. Oh, are you listening to the mu to the radio in the studio while you're potting? Do you call it potting? I, <laughs> yeah, what is it? Uh, <laughs> Throwing? Well, we call it clay making or, I don't know, ceramics. I like potting. While you're potting, <laughs> are you listening to the radio while you're potting? I, I was, and then I got up because I realized you couldn't hear me. So, um, but and you're concerned that on your streams, people are hearing your background music. No, I want them to hear my background music ah. because I'm using OBS for the live stream, and then um, so they can hear. I have my boom mic over my head, and then I want them to listen to Christmas music. So this is complicated. So let's say you've got exactly. Ella Fitzgerald singing a swinging Christmas and you want everybody to hear this while you're throwing the clay on the wheel and you're potting. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the publisher of that music owns the rights to reproduction of that music. And, and so... I, I bought those licenses. Oh. Well, for what? That's the important thing. You go to ASCAP BMI. These are the, that's the licensing organization. And they'll say, oh, good, what are you using it for? 
and it's a different amount of money. You cannot buy licenses for YouTube. I mean, you could, I guess, but it would be prohibitively expensive. I get stuff taken down all the time. In fact, if you listen to this podcast uh, on YouTube or other places, we take the music out. The radio station has licensed the music. I just played Born to be Wild by Steppenwolf. And that's licensed for airplay on the radio. So we are paying a goodly fee to ask at PMI. But it does not license it for other things, podcasts and so forth. So check your license. Yeah. Now, this is one of the things TikTok did that was brilliant. They license all the music. So you don't ever have to worry on TikTok. Twitch also has rights cleared music for creators, but it's not all music. Spotify, if you make a podcast on Spotify, you're allowed to play music in the podcast, but you can't use it behind anything. You can only play the song and then come back to your podcast. So the rights vary considerably. YouTube is very problematic for people because uh, Google's running in the background something called Content ID that fingerprints all the sounds. And even if it's just incidental music, you know, Charlie bit my finger. And in the background, you hear you know, uh, Petula Clark's downtown, you're going to get dinged. Content ID says, I hear Petula Clark. And then when that content ID happens, the music company has several choices. They can say, take it down, take it down. And you can even get a copyright strike. You get three strikes, you're kicked off YouTube. So you got to be very careful about these. More often, the rights company will say, demonetize. He can't make any money on ads from YouTube. But put ads on there and we'll make the money. Those are the most common two choices. Sometimes they just say, oh, that's fine. You know, just have them give credit. And it varies. But that content ID on YouTube is really, it'll, it catches everything. In fact, it sometimes catches things it shouldn't. We were uh, streaming on one of the podcasts. Uh, um, NASA was launching a rocket, or SpaceX was, and we were streaming the NASA feed, which is public domain. NASA makes it available. Anybody can stream it. But National Geographic had, I think, probably accidentally copyrighted it. So National Geographic took down our show because we had a NASA launch in it. And that was wrong, mm -hmm. by the way. That was wrong. So we had to fight it, and we got it put back up and National Geographic got some egg on their face and it was a bad thing. So it is it is kind of a mess, in other words. Yeah. And since you stream everywhere, right? Yeah, so what I did is I bought a license with a company called Soundstripe. Right. And so it's like, and then I pay a yearly fee to use all their music and I can use it on live stream uh, on the platforms that I assign it to and then on my podcast. And then I can also use it for all my videos. And it and it says it says you're licensed for all of that use. Yes. Nice. So only those uses, not anything else. But only for those uses. Yeah. And so, but what I want to do is patch, and I just wanted to see if you guys had a recommendation how to take the because I'm playing the music through my computer. How to get it into OBS Ninja? I mean OBS Studio. It, into my Pixel. And ah, you're streaming from your Pixel. Yeah. So you're using OBS Studio for some of the streams, and that you you figured that out. That's easy because it could pick up yeah. all the audio on yeah. your computer. But you want to get it into your Pixel. Yeah, and then I would people on TikTok can listen to the Christmas music too. Because oh. I just need spinning the wheel and because you use the Pixel to create the TikTok that you're doing, so you want to be able to choose the music from there. I, I mean, th this should be as simple as, as uploading it to Google Drive, downloading it from that site, uploading it to Google Drive, and then being able to pull it up on your Pixel and play it um, if it's a matter of just selecting the file. If it is a matter of, of trying to play the music through the stream, then you would need to do that through OBS, in which case that gets a little more complicated. But I mean, I, How you get it into the Pixel is another... I mean, yeah, exactly. So until TikTok lets me have that ability to use OBS, they haven't given me... No, no, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, boy, hold on for a sec. We're going to take a little break at the bottom of the hour. Johnny Jet's coming up, our uh, travel guru, and uh, I'm going to talk to you off the air, Kelvin. Leo Laporte and Micah Sargent, the tech guys. So there is an app... 
Um, See, normally when people make TikToks, they just say, add this music to the TikTok. But you want to have it as yeah, ambient yeah. sound behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no something the chat room's come up with called Nova Stream Apps. That is for Android. Yeah, that's for Android. So let me see. Let me open this in your browser here and see. Broadcast myself as a free Android client. No, this is not it because this is just an audio stream. This is like making a radio show. So that's not what you want. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you mix. Really, the real question you're asking is, you've got the video on your Pixel. How do I mix audio into that video? Yeah. And I think what everybody just does is play it loud. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's what I've been doing, and, and it doesn't come over well. Because no. Mic, and, and it's million for talking. It's not really designed for... Um, for, uh, yeah, so you, what uh, you can get is a better mic for the Pixel. In fact, come yeah. to think of it, you could get a mixer. Because the Pixel will allow audio coming in through the Type-C jack. That's what I'm thinking you should so do. So that's what you need. Is that's an, that's an, what I'm thinking I'm going to have to go through. Yeah, an audio, so let me see. Audio mixer for Pixel. <laughs> I bet you somebody makes some hardware that will do this. Um. Because you can you can do that. Because so yeah, how are you plugging with a microphone. microphone into the the pixel to to use uh, that? Is it just USB C? And so I have an output input uh, audio uh, splitter to MP, uh, three point uh, five head jack. Okay. But the Pixel Four A still has the head jack. Or headphone jack. Oh, oh yeah, so yeah, using, yeah. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Uh huh. I wonder, could you could you split between the mic as an input and uh, just an MP3 player of some sort as yeah. an input? Because basically, you want to treat. Go ahead. I was trying to find that. I couldn't find it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I think you need yeah. some audio mixer that can basically mix down to just the uh, ed headphone jack or audio jack in that you're doing right now. But see, all you have on the Pixel is this Type C. But I'm pretty sure that you can connect. You can, certainly on an iPhone, you can connect a uh, microphone yeah. to the Lightning. Port. He's I'm using sure. an older Pixel yeah. so that it has. Well, no, you wanted a, a new one, right? No, I don't want a new Pixel. Oh, what I need is to be able to take the music from the computer that's already mixed, which already putting out the microphone audio and putting up the music audio. Take that mix, push it out of the computer into the Pixel. So, it's so you get both the music and yeah, I understand the yeah. And you're saying you use a headphone jack to do that? Yep. So the headphone jack can be an input. So that so on the older uh, analog uh, pixels, you can it's a it's a headphone mic jack. It's a headset jack. I didn't realize yeah. that. Oh, I did, actually I did realize that because you can use a headset with it. Headset. Of course you can. That's why it's a headset jack. So. Uh, what you need is a mixer that will go into a headset jack. Exactly. I'm sure such yeah. a thing exists. Okay. Because I, I was trying to stay away from mixers because those are not necessarily always accessible. So yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. Do you have an ATEM? Are you using the ATEM? No, I'm using the Rode NTG. So the uh, Blackmagic ATEM video mixer does have uh, an audio channel and will take analog audio in and output USB out. That might work. Yeah. I have one at home. I'll have to try it. That's it. Kelvin, keep listening. Okay. I, we don't have an answer yet. Uh, but that's a great question. That's a really interesting question. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time to strap on your wings and go fly with him, Johnny Jet. JohnnyJet.com, his website. He is our travel guru. Travel better with technology. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Leo and Micah. Hello. So, everything's different in the world of Omicron. You said it would be this way last week, and now it is. New travel well, restrictions, new yep, rules, yeah. and... We don't even know if it will continue to change. It might, right? You know what? They say you got to sit tight another week or two to find out how uh, how bad this thing is going to be or not. Hopefully it's not. But um, 
So the U.S. government is going to institute these new rules starting Monday at midnight. So it used to be a three-day testing period if you were unvaccinated. But now it's going to be one day before your flight into the U.S., regardless if you're American or if you're vaccinated or not, you need to um, get this. But, you know, it could have been a lot worse. The travel industry was worried that they were going to institute quarantines, mandatory quarantines when you when you arrived and also testing. They did Ooh, not do that. So goodness. that's still on the table probably for down the line if this new variant or another one is, um, you know, dangerous as can be. But I think... Um, you know, they, we escaped a little bit of a bullet right now, but it's the, just uh, a constantly the, moving target, isn't it? You know, I'm, we're doing, you know, as you know, uh, a cruise for our listeners, a podcast cruise in uh, July, yeah. uh, cruise.twit.tv on Holland, America. And it's to Alaska. It's going to be fun. And we, we they're cutting back the number of cabins that we have available. In fact, I think we're sold out because right. because of COVID, they're, they're not taking as many people. They're spreading it out. So that's one way they're they're handling. And was that from day one? No, they just told us this. Wow. Well, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a little early for the summer. Well, we don't. But that's the thing. We don't. You got you got a plan. You can't sell those cabins and then say, "Oh, you're right. Never mind. You can't go because uh, sometimes uh, they do. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes it does get that bad. Well, I think the cruise industry has definitely learned that there are perils in COVID, and they 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 responded, I think, pretty well. Although, boy, I gotta wonder how they're staying in business. For sure. And I don't think this is a big deal with this new testing 24 hours. You just came back from Mexico. When did you get your test? Was the it day three before. days in advance? Yeah, the, day the day before. before. I, yeah. I think that's what most people are doing. And yeah. I think that's actually the smart way because let's Why say don't you do we- get tested three days before and then you go hang out at all these raging clubs and then you get on the plane and chances are you've been infected. So I, I think people should, the airport should do what LAX is doing. They have free, fast testing for arriving passengers, right? At the airport, yes. Yeah, at the airport. They're just starting that out. Yeah. So I think that's uh, I, th- like I think that solution. is the future. That yeah. is the future. And we talked about this over a year ago when Hawaii started saying they were going to start testing people. Yes, I remember. It just um it just makes sense. Also test, what makes test sense before you go, test on arrival. Test, test, test. And that's 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 what they're going to do and that's what they're hoping to do. And that's why uh the Biden administration said they're going to uh, give these tests out for free. We'll see how that goes. But they also extended the uh, mask mandate, which no one's surprised. It was supposed to end January 18th. I, think I feel now it's going to March. I feel weird now when I go in uh, somewhere and don't wear a mask. It's it feels uncomfortable. It's f- it, because in uh, Marin County, just to the south of us, they've lifted the mask mandate, so you can go into a restaurant without a mask. And I right. still go, "Where's my mask?" I feel a little well, weird. I walked into my hotel last week in New York City and no one's wearing a mask. I go, what's up? And the guy's like, in New York City, if you're fully vaccinated, you do not need to wear a mask. Yeah. Yeah. Get the so, boosters too, right? That's what they're saying now. That's it's, what they're saying. Yeah. I got mine. My wife got mine, hers last night, by the way. And by the way, the trick on that, you cannot get on like CVS.com and it's almost no, impossible. You can't. Just walk in. Just show up. And just show up. And you that's may, how you I may got get mine. turned Hope away. You may get turned away, but you may not. No. I mean, so that's that's a little trick. Also, the WHO is recommending people who are, you know, who have comorbidities. I can't even say that word. Comorbidities. Cor- comorbidities. I'm a trained professional announcer. That's that's why I, that's why I'm your I try to writer. say every syllable in order. <laughs> Cor- com- comorbidities. Yeah. Yep. But they're also saying people over 60 should not be traveling, which I'm surprised what? at that. But this is the WHO. Okay, so. First, I get Medicare, and now I can't travel. What is with? <laughs> I, you know, you, you know, most you travelers are over sixty. That's right. who travels. The only ones who right? can afford to travel. Yeah, and or have the time. Well, it used to be. Now they are traveling a lot younger. Um, but there, and if you are traveling, there are some good deals out there. Hawaiian Airlines has a um, a fifty dollars off a five hundred dollar gift card from Costco. So if you're a Costco member, there's also Alaska Airlines has the same deal. Uh, Southwest Airlines, so that's a, that's an easy way of saving ten percent on the airfare. See, they always do this. Much. They like to tease us. We can't travel, but they make the price really low. So, well, that's been like that. Geez, so. that's, that's just teasing us. Yeah, yeah. And then um, you know, if you're not traveling, actually, this week on Black on Cyber Monday, I bought these mixed tiles. Have you heard of them? 
No, what is a mixed tile? So you do it on your phone or your um, computer. It takes literally a few minutes. You just grab the photos and upload them. So whatever photos you want, you can do it for cheap. On Cyber Monday, it was half off. So I, oh. I advise waiting for one of these big sales because... You know, it's a great way to get your photos up. I'm on. surprised Micah doesn't know about this. He's a. I he's love all, this. Oh, you know about this mixed is tiles. such a great idea. Yeah, yeah. You got a whole and, photo and, wall, and, and you don't need to put nails in the wall. So I bought them for my dad's um, his senior home because you're not supposed to put nails in there. They just stick to the wall. They're really light and they're really cheap when they come, but from from a distance they look great. But when you feel them, they're like, wow, they are pretty cheap, but they look. Um, they look great on a wall. So and my dad needs it for his peel, peel and stick photos, exactly. and they come already framed. They do. Yeah, and you, literally it takes a minute to upload them, and you can crop them. You can delete if you have too many. And I bought sixteen for eighty nine dollars. That's the other a deal. Day. Wow, that is a deal. So I was like, yeah. my dad's going to have so many pictures of my my what kids, a nice his idea. grandkids. Yeah. So if you're not traveling right now, this is a good time. It's also a great time to do it for um, the holidays since. Uh, but again, they are really lightweight and kind of cheap. But hey, you you pay for what you get. Yes. Uh, would you book a cruise today, uh, knowing what we know now? Would you? You know, I, I would wait a week to find out how severe this is, yeah. and then yeah. and then go. I mean, honestly, I I think we're going to be okay. But if you're fully vaccinated, if you're boosted, they say the chances of you getting severe. Um, disease is is rare, but you know they don't know. That's the problem. No one knows. Right. right. That's the most frustrating thing. Right. But you can't blame anyone because they don't know. You just have to sit tight and. Uh, but listen, a, people are traveling. It's a yeah. novel virus. That means it's new. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. Could be good. So, could be bad. I would travel right now, but uh, I, I would use precautions like I have been. I've been wearing a N95 mask or KN95 mask. And I'm staying away from people. I, I spent my miles to fly first class, so I'm, I only had three people around me within six feet on the plane. I feel so sometimes this is the I time feel to use your miles. A little um, antisocial if I keep my mask on. Everybody's taking off their mask, and I'm wearing mine. And I'm. I, I, I don't. I'm like don't, sorry. Don't feel guilty. Just leave no, it on. Don't feel guilty. Yeah. No. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that, and on, on the plane, they tell you, do not take your mask off when other people are eating. Just wait until the, the, your their food comes, let them eat it, and then you eat your You're food. supposed to take a bite, then put your mask on, take a bite. Well, put no your... one does that. Okay. Nobody does that. <laughs> okay? I, I, I've, I've been flying often lately, and I haven't seen anybody do that. No. Lift your mask up, sip your beverage, quickly <laughs> shut it down. No. no. Nobody does that. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, <sighs> how much time we got? 37 seconds, 34, 37 33, okay. 32, okay. So in the 31. news this week, George Clooney just um, turned down a $35 million commercial from an airline, and everyone's trying to figure out which airline it is. I think it's either one of three. Why did he it's turn he, it down? Because he said that the, the country's an ally, but they're kind of uh, Emirates. iffy. I thought it was maybe Emirates, but I'm thinking it's, it's Saudi Arabia. Oh yeah, Formerly I would. I, would Arabian Airlines I wouldn't do an ad for because Saudi. they have big money. Thirty-five million dollars for one day of shooting. Yeah, no, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, JohnnyJet.com. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Our show today actually brought to you by UserWay.org. Uh, we have a lot of blind listeners. Radio, of course, is perfect if you're blind because there's no pictures. But the web is not quite the same, is it? Uh, very frequently, if you're blind, you'll get to a website. It's incomplete. You can't use it. The, sh the shopping cart doesn't work or the pictures uh, are just blobs, blank, empty on the screen. That's why the ADA, the Americans with Disability Acts, and the World Wide Web Consortium have the WCAG guidelines, the Web Content Access Guidelines, which say what you need to do as a website owner to make your site accessible to everybody, even people with disabilities. Now, this is really important. Because not only, you know, there's three reasons. It's the right thing to do. That should be enough. It's right. You don't want to make your site accessible. But it's also a legal requirement. You can get sued. In fact, a big pizza company got sued. They went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, you have to make your site accessible. They said, but your honor, we have a phone number. Nope. That's separate but equal. It's not the same thing. So the Supreme Court has ruled you have to be ADA compliant because all websites are public, public entities. The third reason, the real reason is, well, another, well they're all good reasons, but the, uh, another good reason is you're turning away business. 
If somebody can't use your shopping cart, they're not going to buy from you. The, the solution is surprisingly affordable, very easy to implement. It's called UserWay. UserWay.org. With one line of JavaScript, UserWay can achieve more than an entire team of developers. And I, you know, I know this because when, when we face this with our own websites, I was like kind of glum thinking, oh, I got a lot of work to do. UserWay makes it easy. Making your website accessible is absolutely overwhelming. But UserWay solutions make it simple, easy. It's very affordable. If you're worried, check out the scanning tool. It's free at uh, the website. See if your site is ADA compliant. UserWay.org slash twit. It's used by the biggest companies in the world. A million websites, including Coca-Cola, Disney, eBay, FedEx. But it's also affordable for small websites and medium businesses. Millions of people need UserWay just to purchase your products. And when you need to scale, hey, if Disney can use it, you can use it. It'll work no matter how big you get. Auto uh, generates the alt tags so those pictures suddenly can be heard. The, the screen reader can say, that's a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. It uses AI for that. It'll fix those complex nav menus. Frankly, a lot of users need that. Achilles heel for companies, these menus. Uh, forms, shopping carts, pop-ups are accessible. Vague links, violations are fixed. Any broken links, and make sure your website uses accessible colors. And you'll get a detailed report of all the violations that were fixed on your website. It works with everything. It's a simple line of JavaScript. There's even plugins for WordPress, Shopify, Wix. It works with AEM, Sitecore, SharePoint. It works with your hand-coded site, too. UserWay integrates seamlessly with anything. And it lets your business meet its compliance goals and improve the experience for your users. Just ask the voice of Siri. Hi, I'm Susan Bennett, the original voice of Siri. You won't hear me say something like this too often. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're looking for. But every day, that's what the internet is like for millions of people with disabilities. UserWay fixes all of that with just one line of code. UserWay can make any website fully accessible, ADA compliant, with the user way, everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly and customize it to fit their needs. It's also a great way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. It's just the right thing to do. Userway.org slash twit. You get 30% off right now their AI-powered accessibility solution. Userway, making the internet accessible for everyone. Userway.org slash twit. We thank them so much for their support of the Tech Guy Show. Leo Laporte. The Tech Guy with Micah Sargent. The Tech Guys, plural. You get two today. Avocado Walt on the line from Fallbrook. Hello, Avocado Walt. You call yourself Avocado Walt, as I remember, because you run an avocado orchard. Walt, come over. Come over to the phone, Walt. You're on the air. Hey, oh, Leo. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm in a store and I'm talking to the lady here. No, that's fine. With you. Do you have a farm? Yeah. Do you have a a store on your farm? Actually, I'm at Henning's uh, Wood Burning Fireplaces oh, in nice. uh, Vista, California. Very getting nice. Some, uh, fire starters. Yeah. Give, give them up. Tell me, you just got a big plug on uh, on KFI in Los Angeles. The, the... Hi, Leo. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we talked to you Walt, a little while ago about your avocado orchard. And, and you wanted to put sensors out there on the trees, as I remember. Well, no, my I have two controllers. I have high tech. That's right. You have the controllers. You wanted to get them yeah. on the network. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I and I kept losing connection to one, and it's critical because then my trees don't get watered. So I tried everything, and I finally decided I'm calling Leo. He'll know what to do. Yeah. And you mentioned, is there I can say the name of the product? Yes, you may. You mentioned that I get it. You mentioned that I should try an Orbi. Yeah, the Netgear Orbeez. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, they, the manufacturer of the uh, controllers said it won't work with a mesh system, and I told you that. So you made some other suggestions to do this and do that, an antenna and a bunch of other stuff. But I called the manufacturer of the, thank you, I called the manufacturer of the uh, controllers, and I said, hey, Leo said that your controllers should work uh, with this mesh system, and so you better fix it, because it, it was a security issue. All right. So they fixed it. Oh! So they said they said it should. We don't want to be bad mouthed on. Wow! Leo. The power of the tech guy show, all over the country, yeah. coast to coast. Wow! That's why. I, that's why. So I which Orbi did you get? 
Uh, well, they sell it at uh, one of those big box stores. And they fix uh, it in the software so you could buy the existing hardware. And does it work? It, it's unbelievable. I am so happy. I can't even tell you. Nice. And yeah, now we get the best fantastic. alligator pairs in the business because of Orby. Thank you, Avocado. What's the name of your avocado uh, farm? Oh, it's just my name, Wurtz Properties. But anyway, it's... Uh, so I wouldn't go there to buy avocados. You sell them to the stores. I sell to Index that sells to places like Costco and places oh, like that. okay. Because I, yeah. I love a good avocado. Man, they're yeah. good. But we do sell the ones... No, they'll only buy Haas from us because they hold up in the containers you put them in. They weigh 1,000 pounds full. So if I were to put my Fortes in there, it would be mush by the time it got to wow. the house. But the Fortes are better, huh? Well, so a lot of people like Fortes. They're they're more watery and they're creamier. And, mm. um, but uh, so we do sell to local stores, but then I have to pick them and count them. And so I've finally got a guy that owns, uh, he has six fruit stands. And what he does is he comes and picks them and pays me right there. That's what we used to do. And, uh, yeah. yeah. He takes them. And so, uh, and he pays me the same as the stores were paying me. So I don't know. Nice. To and he sells them at a little bit of a markup. He makes a living, and you get to put your fuertes out there in the world. And I'm jealous now. I want to go get some. I want to try a fuerte avocado now. We had two avocado trees, but when I was growing up, but the real problem was the 40 persimmon trees because nobody. Oh, I like persimmons. Nobody wants persimmons, <laughs> so we would do exactly the same thing, guys. A group group of people come in, they'd pick them, they'd sell them, they give us a part of the proceeds. It was a great deal. I, I actually grow persimmons. I have several persimmon trees, and I have uh, cherimoyas, and we have uh, citrus, and a bunch of other stuff. But uh, make excellent I, cookies I and like bread. But yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah, would, freeze, would them. freeze them. We'd freeze them, and then too ripe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because they're, they're really like little hard. They're really hard. To what eat. citrus do you have? Oh, well, we have several varieties of orange trees. Nice. Um, and uh, all of this is in Fallbrook. It's in Fallbrook. Nice. Amazing. Yeah. Fallbrook is a, just coming into its own right now. I mean, the, the, the prices here have stayed about the same for years and years, and all of a sudden, prices have more than doubled just recently. Well, how much for a good avocado? A good fuerte? Well, uh, it, it, you can get them in, in town here in Fallbrook for a dollar. Okay, that's a good price. I'm moving. I'm there. heading there I'm now. Coming. We're going. Yeah. We're on our way. Save I a house for us. I'm glad the Orby worked for you. And what I'm really amazed is, and kudos to Netgear that you called them. They said, "Oh, well, we better fix that," and they did. No, no, it was the maker of the controller that I called. Oh, the other way around. Yeah, the controller had to yeah. work. Can yeah, I, yeah, yeah, can yeah. I tell you the name of that company. Sure. That that's Hunter Industries, and their controllers are unbelievable. So the controllers that I have, they're weather based, and they have sensors too. So my controller knows if it's how much rain we've had in the last week, and if we've had more wow. than one inch, it won't it won't water. Very if I've smart. Had four tenths in the last twenty four inches hours, it won't water. If the wind speeds twenty miles an hour or greater, it won't water. And you set all these things yourself. Yeah. Um, it it, uh, it plus I can water more frequently. And so I can cut the time down because the tree knows it's going to get watered again in so many more days. And so it takes all the, it, you know, it, it, it knows the temperature. It knows the water moisture level at five inches and a foot. So let's say the program is saying we should, uh, we should water. But the sensor says, wait a minute, it's still wet at five inches. It won't water. And, and so probably, these guys a, listen to their customers and they fixed the problem, which is awesome. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Well, they were afraid that they were afraid they didn't want to you know they didn't want anybody talking bad about it. Well, them. now they're getting a great big plug, hunterindustries.com. Yeah, the controllers are I had my controllers are called HCCs and it's just the programming that you can do on it. And once you get it set up, so let's say we're down in the grove a mile and we're looking for leaks. So the system's running. And you see a leak. I used to have to hop in my Ranger drive back up to the where the controller is shut it off, go down to fix it, come back up, turn it on, go down and find out there's still a problem, go up and shut it off again. Now I just take my phone out of my pocket, huh. I, shut, I shut it off, we fix it, I take my phone out of my pocket, I turn it back on again, and it's either either we got to fix it again or it's good, you know? The controllers are great. 
Awesome. Yeah, now they do. They do a lot more than what I told you. They, they. Uh, you, know, you, you don't have to tell me the whole, the whole list. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, right. I hope you got a nice stove. You, you, solve, you solve my problem. No, no, I was getting fire starters for oh, my okay. for my wood burner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you solve my problem. And uh, Henning's got a plug. And, Everybody uh, got a plug. plug. Everybody's happy. <laughs> hey, it's a yeah. pleasure talking to you again, Walt. Thanks for the update. I, I really like hearing if a solution that we uh, suggested worked. And actually, you went the extra mile by getting Hunter to fix their thing, and uh, that's great. Yeah. You made a lot of people happy, well, I bet. And I, I, I appreciate you because I listen to you all the time, even though I don't understand 95% of what you guys are talking about. But it makes me feel smarter <laughs> by the end of the day. So. Well, now I now I know more about uh, avocados and 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 uh, irrigation <laughs> than I probably will ever need. Well, but it's good to it's good to have that there. Look at the label. Make sure you're buying U.S. avocados and none of I those will. avocados from other. Yeah, no, okay. American made. Yeah, God bless it. Okay. Hey, thank you. Well, it's great to talk to you. Love your show. Thank Bye. you, sir. Yeah, I'm glad there was a happy ending on Yay. that. Always Those good. Orbeez are good. They're really good for distance. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's one of the things they do very well. And they, the only thing I don't like about uh, the Orbeez is every six months they have a new model. And they're very expensive. <laughs> yeah. oh. And I go, oh, man, I just bought the 6.1. Six, six, now they have 6E. Oh, my. So... That's the only problem, but that's technology. They are at the bleeding edge when it comes to the Wi-Fi yeah. technologies. Yeah, yeah. yeah some yeah, companies yeah. will stick with Wi-Fi six forever or for a long, long time before they move up. You know? Apparently, you know, CES is going to be on in Vegas, and <sighs> it's coming up in January. And get ready because Wi-Fi seven is going to be announced. Please just stop the insanity. Yeah, I am still doing it retcon. So day three, I got a little behind on the advent of code because. Uh, well, we went out to dinner, so it comes out. It's bad time. It comes out 9 p.m., which is midnight East Coast. So it's when the you know, so December 1st at midnight was the first one. Did the first two problems quickly and easily. Three, day three, I was out to dinner. Then, as I mentioned, chess championship went eight hours. So I didn't really get to it till later yesterday or the day before yesterday. I guess it was now. When was it? Yeah, it was Thursday. And it's all of a sudden, it's, usually the first five problems are cake and then it gets hard. But this one was tricky. And I, I think it's probably because it's, I'm, not, I'm missing something. So often with the advent of code, there's the obvious naive solution, sometimes a brute force solution. And it takes a long time or whatever. Um, this one isn't taking a long time. It's just ugly. It's just ugly. It's, which tells me there's got to be an elegant more elegant way to do it. So just to give you an idea, you got, you got, uh, so <laughs> there's always a, a backstory to this. In this case, Santa, for reasons unknown, or the elves, maybe it's the elves, I don't know, are in a submarine for reasons unknown. And first you had to chart the depth of the submarine and the distance. And then, but now you have, there's an error code readings and you're getting error code readings, which is a series of binary numbers, 1000 binary strings of 12 characters each, one zero one zero zero one one zero zero one one. You have to take those thousand <laughs> strings, add up the f each place individually, the first column, the second column, the third column, the fourth column, all the 12 columns. Actually, you don't have to add them up. What you're supposed to do, I figured out you can just do it by adding them up, but what you're supposed to do is figure out if there's more ones or zeros in the column. If there's more ones then you add then you then there's a one in that place in the gamma number if there's fewer ones it's in the epsilon number well i figured out pretty quickly oh i just divide the count i'll have to count up the number of ones in there and i divide that by the total number of entries a thousand no no if i if it's if it's greater than half of a thousand if it's greater than 500 then there were more ones than zeros there's either ones or zeros so anyway it's easy to figure that out. So you figure that out. Now you got a number, which is your gamma. You have to convert that binary to that decimal, which is the thing I just finished doing. And then you multiply gamma times epsilon, and then you get the number, and that's the answer to your problem. I'm sure there is something I'm missing about these numbers that you don't have to manually, because basically that's what my code is doing. It's going through the thousand numbers one by one, and then within each number, it's going through the 12 places, one by one, it's adding them up. So it goes, so it goes through the list and it, and it 
adds up. It keeps it keeps in a, you know and adds them up. And then it, anyway, it's 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 ugly. It just feels ugly. It feels like there should be some like mathematical thing. Like oh well, if you just added up all the binary numbers and divided by sigma, right. you'd get the answer. There's something. I feel like there's got to be something because otherwise it's just ugly. But I mean, it's doable. It's not hard. Um, I it'd be pretty easy in an imperative language because it's just a bunch of for loops. It's a little more tricky in a functional language, but I'm pretty used to that because you're going to do a lot of um, recursive calls. But anyway, yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I mean, I have a number of recursive calls. Are you doing it, assert? Good, assert zero. <laughs> I can show you the the problem. <laughs> so it's you know it's doable it's just a bunch of i'm using i'm using uh folds to do it it's just a bunch of folds but seems like i'm i'm taking the long way around i just can't figure out why you know sometimes you look to look at code and you uh go oh that's that's too that's inelegant it seems inelegant well hey 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 how are you today leo laporte here the tech guy, time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, uh, ag augmented reality, virtual reality, reality, reality. 8888 Ask Leo is the phone number. 888 827 5536. Toll free from anywhere in the US or Canada. Micah Sargent's with me. It's the two tech guys. Hello, hello. Manny, Mo, and nobody answering your calls. <laughs> At 8888-ASK-LEO. Um, should we go back to the phones, you think? Back to the phones. Back I think to we life, can go. Back to reality. Yeah, let's see. Uh, Bud, on the line from Anaheim. Hello, Bud. Hello, Leo. Hello, Bud. Can you hear? Oh, wait. I can hear you. Uh-oh. Oh. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh. Must be in that dead spot. <laughs> no. No, there's something going on. Okay, here. can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Mr. Verizon. Okay. Yes. Good, good. Okay, yeah, it's my Verizon. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the question is, I have a two-story, about 2,000-square-foot condo. Um, I have a TP-Link router, and I have a garage. And when you go in the garage, it's like a dead spot, probably because of the thickness of the wall. Yeah, you probably have a firewall. Most garages do in case there's a fire in yeah. the garage, yeah. Right, so... So I tried an extender out there, and it's that's just the same way. It's just dead out there. Yeah. Uh, so you know, everybody's been talk, talking to me, trying to talk me into a mesh system. No, mesh is not going to solve it this time. So yeah. let's not get a mesh system. And here's why. You, yeah, there may be metal in that wall, uh, which is death to Wi-Fi. So uh, the problem is these Wi-Fi signals are a very high frequency. They're mic. They're actually microwave. Signals, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. Right. Microwave, yeah, exactly. if you know radio, doesn't, you know, the reason you don't get fried by your microwave oven, it doesn't go through things very well. And uh, walls are a problem. Actually, one of the biggest problems in Wi Fi is human bodies. They're big sacks of water, and the Wi Fi just bounces off of us. So I don't think a mesh is going to help that way. It could. If you can, you know, if a little bit of a signal could eke through that wall, a mesh might help. But I think you've got better ways of solving this. You mentioned TP-Link. They make, uh, they mention, they make something that I've used uh, that I really like called a power line networking. Uh, it, I, I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah. And the idea is you already have wires in your wall that go from your house into the garage. It's called your electrical and as long as there isn't a fuse box or junction or you know something interrupting the wire between where your router is and the garage, you can easily and fairly inexpensively buy a power link setup. So what you would have is at your base unit, you'd take one of those Ethernet wires and connect it to a TP-Link power line module that you plug in. Now, in effect, you're plugging that Ethernet into the wall, into the grid, the electrical power. And then on the other end in the garage, you plug in the other end. And that can be a Wi-Fi unit. It could be Ethernet. TP-Link sells a variety of things. Probably what you want is the Wi-Fi unit. You plug that in, and now it's going through the electrical instead of trying to get through that impervious, 
imper impermeable wall. So I'm a fan of Powerline, and you already have TP-Link gear. It would be, you, you know, it's not very expensive. It works quite well. Uh, and I think that's probably going to be, uh, it's certainly cheaper than getting a, uh, a uh, mesh network. And if everything else is working, it's just that one spot, this would be the way to do it. Okay. Uh, now, one other quick question. I have, my son gave me an R, uh, Netgear Orby RBS50. We were just talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, can I put can I put that in bridge mode to my current router and use that satellite say downstairs in my bedroom where I got less of a signal? So he I gave you know. he gave you the RB fifty. He gave me the satellite and the and the. Oh, he gave you both. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. yeah. So that is a mesh system. You could a best way to use it, frankly, would be just to take your TP Link out and use the Orbi base unit as in the same way you use your TP Link, and then put a. Only only problem is I got a ton of stuff, uh, home networking or home, uh, you know, smart home stuff that two point four that talk to my router with, you know, with uh, static IPs and all kinds of stuff in there that I really don't want to redo all over again. Um, so, yeah, so you want to put it in, in bridge mode. So you'll let the TP-Link continue to route, but just right. use the Orbi as a Wi-Fi. You, you'd want to turn off the TP-Link Wi-Fi, too, by the way. Turn off the radio. Right. Okay. And just use the Orbi. You don't want two Wi-Fi radios. They'll, they'll compete with each other. But just use the Orbi as a, yeah, you can do that. That would work fine. And it might even solve the garage problem. That's a mesh system. So, uh, And it's pretty powerful. Uh, so you might put that base... I don't know if you want to put the the uh, the extender in the garage, but you try it and see if it works, and you don't need to buy anything. Yeah, that's that's a thought. I thought an extender worked as essentially the same. It's not the same. Here's the, the, the there are many differences, but the big difference, what, the way an extender works, is a, a repeater. So. It communicates with the base station, says, okay, here's the information. Base station talks to it, and then it repeats it on to you. That means the bandwidth is cut in half because half the time yeah, it's I, talking to the base station, half the time it's talking to you. But the, the TP-Link extender has a different SSID. So essentially it's radio when you're talking to it. That's caused a lot of problems. I once had that set up and everything went down. My you you can, if you want, set it up with the same SSID. Now that will even cost more. <laughs> yeah, that okay. Really yeah. Right, like well, well, you know, this is hysterical because I until, you know, 15 years ago, this was the, pro the, the, the province of trained professionals who went to school and learned how networking worked. And it was, it was a very advanced form of computing. You know, we didn't ever talk about networking. All of a sudden, everybody's a network guru in their own house, right? And it is complicated. And there's all sorts of things you can do to, to bring it down. Our earlier caller, who I think had a, a problem with her Wi-Fi, uh, you know, it's easy to mess it up because... We're normal. We're not network gurus. So, yeah, I mean, you, if you don't mind learning a lot of stuff, you can you can use the same SSID. There's rules and so forth. But I think the best, it sounds like to me this is going to be a good solution. Keep your TP-Link router. Put it in, uh, turn off the radios. So just it's just a plain hardware router, hardwired router. Connect it to the Orbi base station. The Orbi base station should be in, in and it doesn't work quite as well. Most mesh routers want to be the DHCP router, but this will work fine. Put it in bridge mode so it's not doing network address translation. And then it will still communicate with its uh, its uh, subunit in a better way than a uh, an extender. As I said, the extender cuts it in half. The whole thing about mesh was, oh, no, we've got a private back channel, so we're full speed. Uh, there are other benefits to mesh, but that's 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 one of them. I like the Orbeez particularly for something like this. So you might be able to, you might be able to get into your garage just fine. Yeah, I've been in the ITB's business uh, longer than God's been on earth. Oh, all right. Well, you know a little about this stuff then. My first software uh, program I wrote was in 1965. So In Fortran, no doubt. No, no. It was actually assembly language. Oh, even better. For uh, for uh, IBM System 70 or? No, uh, Univac. You ever heard of Univac? Univac, yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. For an 1108? Uh, uh, Do you remember? 1108, 1107. 1107, okay. Eckert and Mockley. Yep. 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 <laughs> still in the business. We still, we still, believe it or not, we have customers all over the world that are still using the uh, Univac OS 2200 uh, operating system. Wow. Big, big system. And, and you still provide them with software? Yes, we do. We wow. Yep. Well, you know my motto, if it ain't broke... Keep it running for hundreds of years. <laughs> we thought we I I'm I'm almost eighty years old. I thought we'd be out of business a long time ago. Isn't and that fascinating. Uh, hoping, but it? it's uh, we're still going strong and we still have software engineers taking care of it. So Oh you bet you do. You bet yeah. you do. You were probably in great demand uh in nineteen ninety nine as we headed into the year two thousand and the Y two K problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Everybody was uh it was doomsday. We wrote some special software. It allowed uh, us to uh, simulate the date change so that uh, customers could run their software, cool. simulate the date change to see what was going to happen to it. People, you know, when nothing happened on January 1st, 2000, people said, oh, see, it was overblown. But I knew better. It was people like you who put in many hours of, of, of work to make it so that we could survive the transition because there was a lot of stuff that broke. That's that's right. Yeah, you know, we, yeah. We, we, we did a good job. We, Thank you. We sold a lot of software for that little transition. The next one's in 2038. You know, uh, I'm I'm not going to be here, <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it. Hey, a pleasure to talk to you, bud. Thank you. Thank my, you for my, your advice. Yeah, thank you. Great to talk to you. Now, there's some history on the on the hoof, it. as they it. say. 2038, uh, so the Y2K problem was caused because a lot of programmers in the 60s and 70s and 80s took a shortcut. Instead of representing the year in, with four digits, 2010, they represented it with two digits. So the problem was, you know, they represented 1978 as 78. The problem is when we in the, uh, at, at, suddenly we're in the 2000s, it's not going to work. 2078, what? What is, you know, so a lot of software might have uh, failed dramatically if it weren't for people uh, like Bud, who, who whose company went out and they, and they found the flaws and they fixed them. The next time that's going to happen is when the Unix epoch ends in 2038, uh, we will roll over. <laughs> we will, in 2038, we go back to uh, zero and start over. The Unix epoch began in January 1st, 2000s, uh, or rather 1970, and they didn't give it enough bits to survive past 2038. You know why? Why? Same reason the programmers said two digits are enough. They never thought this <sighs> software would still be in use in the distant future of 2035 or 2038. They thought in the year 2038, if man can survive, they thought this is going to be, you know, they'll, they won't still be using Unix. Well, we are. In fact, uh. more than ever. So that's going to be the next one. Can people stop doing this then? Can we just say, oh, no. <laughs> no, we don't learn our count. lessons. We don't learn our lessons. Not at all. Y2K38. Get ready. Uh, our <laughs> uh, I'm sure it won't be a problem. I'm sure everything will be fine. They're probably fixing it right now. Even as we speak. Yes, I hope that's right. I don't. I didn't. I don't know, but I hope you're right. Uh, he says, uh, out of sync. Who, who knows? I think says uh, most versions of Unix and Linux are using uh, larger oh, uh, good. time so values. Oh, good. So they started to switch in. Yeah, I can't remember if it was a 16-bit value or a 32-bit value, but it rolls over after 68 years. And uh, Mocha would be. We did a Mocha thing last time. Somebody asked this question. And uh, we, it's, I mean, how many people have XLR jacks in their garage? Not a whole lot of people. Yeah. So I think that's why I didn't is a more general. It. Yeah, it's a more general solution. One of the things, Frank, I meant, I meant to talk about, talk about this with you. One of the problems um, people sometimes have with shows like this, and I've had it with some of my other hosts, is over answering. Like, Really, when people call, they just want a simple answer uh -huh. and a clear answer. And it's we know multiple ways to do anything, right? So it's always a temptation to. It, it, so it's a tr it, it, the, the 
if if at all possible, I my I always try to make it as clear a path as possible mm -hmm. without a lot of. On the other hand, or you could try or do this, and it's hard because we know all those things, and right. many of them, you know, mocha might be better for somebody. So it's not bad to say mocha, you know, mocha and power line, but it's, you know, it's it's okay to just say one. Right, I see what you mean. And make yeah. that answer be like very clear, because remember, for him, maybe there is maybe mocha would be better. Mm -hmm. And what you don't want to go is like, but you probably don't have a cable jack in your garage, exactly. and it just it yeah. big bogs it all down. Yeah. So the so I wish I were an exemplar of this. I'm not, but the goal is to make it as linear and clear and yeah. laser-like I mean, as to, possible. And, and all, that was exactly the reason why I didn't mention Mocha there, because we the caller did not say, I've right. got a cable in my garage right. or anything like that. So why mention that why if you bring don't it know? Because yep. we don't have enough time. Good instinct. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough time, <laughs> exactly. And we also want to make it as intelligible as we yeah. in our limited. I'm personally not a fan of Powerline because ah. of some of the signal jitter issues that can happen with oh, it. And so okay. that's why I, but, oh, okay. But... It is, they continue to improve upon it, and if you do have, and the problem is that I came from a house where the electric, not now, but house- A I more modern in, house won't have those exactly, problems. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lived in a house where that was not the case. There weren't neutral wires in every room well, and everything. Also, part of the thing that's harder to get is we're not really here to help anyone. Individually. Individually. Yeah. We're more here to kind of teach people about stuff. Yeah, it's, that's the toughest. And that's the hard one, because you want to, you're, and you're, you're right, you want to help them. I don't care. <laughs> they don't care either, by the way. They just want to call and be on the radio and have a good conversation. And I, don't, I think a lot of sometimes you can hear the pain in people's voices. They really do want a solution, but they're, they shouldn't call us. <laughs> if they really want help, they shouldn't call us. Now, all the people listening are going, what the? <laughs> this podcast brought to you by Get Ready for This. Are you ready? I'm ready. AT&T. It is 2021. Did you know? People can acquire self-driving cars. They can eat hamburgers made out of plants. They can even fly to space in rocket ships if they've got $28 million lying around. So if you can do all this futuristic stuff right now, the very least your phone should be able to do is stream a show without having it lag over and over again. For that... There's AT&T 5G. AT&T 5G is fast, reliable, and secure. It makes it easy to download entertainment in the flash, to stay connected across the city, and helps keep your device protected even from spam calls. Want to make sure your phone service keeps up with what you need from it? Get AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires a compatible plan, may not be in your area. See at and com slash 5G for you for details. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. The Gizwiz coming up in just a little bit with a uh, gadget, kind of a junky gadget <laughs> that I'll probably buy anyway because that's, that's just, you know, he's such a good salesman. Chuck is on the line. Our next call from San Diego. Hi, Chuck. Hey, Leo. How are you today? I am well. How are you? Say hi to Micah Sargent, also with us today. Hello, Chuck. The two hey, tech guys. Hey, I wonder if you, did you, either of you gentlemen recall ever watching the uh, great movie, This is Spinal Tap? Oh, yeah. Uh, of course. It goes to goes 11. To 11. <laughs> well, when I'm, when I'm watching Hulu um, and a commercial comes on, it sounds like it's going to that Marshall. <laughs> I love it. To 11. It's going to 11. Yep. yep. Yeah, there is an FCC rule about the volume of commercials, how loud they can be. They're not supposed to be louder. But loudness is also uh, more than just the volume. And so uh, I think co often commercial uh, uh, sound mixers do tricks that, you know, it's technically the same decibel level. It's not supposed to be much louder than anything else. They're all supposed to be the same, and the TV station is supposed to regulate it. I don't know if on the internet. I was going to say rules. that's what they do is they circumvent it by because it's not. It may not the... be the same rules, but I, bet, I, you know, it's not in their interest to really annoy people. But they make things more punchy. Back in the days of AM radio, for instance, um, you remember that sound? Uh, you probably don't remember it, Micah. You're too young. But Boss Radio had a real. Punchy sound because they they would run it through uh, a, a special system called a compressor to give it some punch. 
<laughs> and it would make the levels of the quietest as, as loud as the levels of the loudest, and it all sounded much louder as a result. Of course, the whole idea is you're turning down the dial. This back when we had radios. You're turning down the dial, and they, they want the station to jump at you. And I suspect that some advertisers are doing that. Um, there may be in your system whether you're, you have an AV receiver or a television, depending on what's doing the audio, there may be a setting to moderate that. They have well, there's, the I mute button. I, oh, I, yeah. I have the TCL TV that I bought because you talked about it, and it's got, it says volume leveling. Yeah, there you go. But that doesn't seem to do anything. <laughs> well, all it's going to do is make it the same dB. So if they're doing other tricks... You know, if you put an echo on it, it would definitely jump out at you, but it would be the same volume. So that may be that they're doing the same tricks because the TV is supposed to level the volume. Uh, mm -hmm. It may, it, it, it probably just on or off, right? I'm sorry? Is it just on or off? There's no yeah. no, no other setting. It's not like do it 90% uh, more or 10% less or yeah, anything. No, no, unfortunately, no. Yeah. Unfortunately, no. Uh, I mean, you can buy other you know, external stuff that will do that. But I don't think, I think that's a, a unneeded yeah. expense. Yeah. It's just well, annoying. It may yeah. be, it may be, and I, I haven't watched Hulu in a while. It may be that they're saying, Oh, that FCC rule, we're not broadcast. We can ignore that. Well, so. I, you know, I, I, I went online just to look around a little bit and, you know, there's a theory that, that they do it intentionally because they want you to pay for the commercial free version. Oh, Oh, but, you know, that's just, you know, that's just rumor. I, I, I feel there, there are kind of two issues that are going on here. That is, is an interesting one. But it's also the fact that all of these different commercials that they're getting are coming from different places. They're not leveled yeah, to the they, same audio level. So you may have ones that are quieter, are louder. And ultimately, yeah, without that kind of regulation there to say it has to be at this volume and no, uh, no louder, it does. I love the name of the FCC Me rule. Too. It's the CALM, Calm Act. Act yep. The Commercial Advertisement Loudness Mitigation Calm Act. Um, I guess the Calm Act probably. Oh yeah, look. Yeah, I became very familiar with the Calm Act uh, back when I was working in a news video publication because we started to broadcast, and at that point we had to make sure that our videos were at this. But up to that point, we did not have to. So it's also the a the average sound. So part of it can be really loud, and then they make the rest quieter, and that will make it better. Um, I, there are a lot of posts about this on Hulu, so maybe it is a problem. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Um, I'm looking at a Looper.com article. The real reason Hulu commercials are so loud, the FCC doesn't regulate them. And um, Well, I don't know if they go on and beyond that, except they're not regulated. They're loud because they can be. They're loud because they can be. And just complain to Hulu. It's interesting. I like the hand claps in this. This brought hand claps to mainstream media. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 88. I don't know. Do you even know this song? At the car of wash? Of course. You know the movie, oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the movie. Car wash, baby. I know the song. 88. Rose Royce is the name of the group. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. Like Rolls Get Royce. Yeah. yeah, but not. But not. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Rose Rice. Amy on the line from Huntington Beach, California. Hello, Amy. Hi. Hi. My son's laptop was recently stolen at college. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. No. Yeah, it was from his dorm room with his Xbox as well. So both of them are kind of lost. And we, we canceled the services and and reported it stolen and Ugh. changed his password and did all that. So we're looking at buying a, a another laptop and I'm seeing on Amazon and Walmart like refurbished or renewed. And I'm just wondering, are those worth buying? I don't really want to spend fifteen hundred on I don't a, blame you. On a new laptop. So Often refurbished means simply somebody bought it, never used it, returned it, the box is open, they can't sell it as new. So if you go, if you get it from the right person, refurbished is fine. And by the right person, I mean the original manufacturer or perhaps the store that, you know, you're buying it from. Uh, so it's a, 
MacBook Air. Yeah, I would only get MacBooks from Apple. They have a refurb store. Take a look at their prices. They're not going to be as aggressive as Amazon's. But it's much, much safer. What you want is you want to get it from the manufacturer so that when it's refurbished, it is factory new and the warranty is still there, which you wouldn't get in many cases if you don't buy it from the manufacturer. Yeah, Amazon gives 90 days. So yeah, Apple gives a year. Years. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. check, go to apple.com slash shop slash refurbished and just see if you can. The problem is Apple's prices are not as aggressive. You might save a few hundred bucks. Uh, it's a risky thing to buy a refurbished laptop from somebody other than the manufacturer. The only exception I, I would give you is if it's from a big box store that has a long, you know, Costco, for instance, has very long warranties and really good return policies. Um, but you don't want to buy it from Joe's refurbed laptop store because what Joe probably did, <laughs> you know, is wipe the drive put a stolen copy of the operating system on it and sells it to you for a greatly reduced price. It may not be fully refurbished. It may not be in very good shape at all. You, the risk of buying a used laptop is you're buying somebody else's problems often. <laughs> right. And yeah. yeah, some of them say they have dents or something. So it's like, was it dropped? Is there going to be problems? Yeah. What other things? But, yeah. What's renewed. There are some that say renewed. That usually means they went in and, uh, took stuff out. It means basically refurbished. It it depends who okay. you're talking to. There's no legal uh, definition of the terms. Um, I would be careful with renewed and renewed is basically used. You know, when you get a used car, what do they, they have all sorts of euphemisms, previously owned, you know, certified. That's like renewed. <laughs> we'll also include a link uh, over on techguylabs.com to the education uh, refurbished yes, store. Because so he'll get a good deal. Education he'll discount get a better as deal well. As a student. Yeah. yeah. So it looks like you can combine the two. You can go to the education store and for Apple and get it refurbished. So that'll save even a little bit more money. The good news is right now you can get a MacBook Air, their lowest end, new, based on the new processor, which is much faster than any Intel. And I bet you he had an Intel Mac. You can get a MacBook Air for 800 bucks so oh. i would absolutely look at the macbook air it is as fast as anything he could possibly have had okay and go through the on the apple's website there's an education store so yeah. you can get a discount yeah you get the college. edu discount on top of the refurbished discount oh, okay i'm right. sorry that happened to your boy that's terrible it's awful it was i know the one day the Xbox was on the following day, his backpack with his laptop. What kind of crazy college is he going to? Is it's this the school of hard knocks? It's a small college in Kansas. It's a Catholic. Who would have thought, university. right? Oh. And it's probably another student in that case. Oh, yeah. I'm so yeah. sorry. Yeah. I am it's so right. sorry. It was in 2017, and he's happy with it. So it's like, if I could find that same computer... No, you don't. Okay, so here's the thing with Apple. They have now left Intel chips behind, and they're doing their own chips. The good news about that is these are much faster than four years ago. Much. And at not an increased price. So he, if he was happy with 2017, he will be 10 times happier Absolutely. With, with the 2021 or... You know, just look at, make sure it's an M1 based. You don't, you want the newest processor. Okay. Apple has, right. has, has left behind Intel. And so that was going to be obsolete sooner than later anyway. Okay. So there, there you go. See, you know what? Yeah. You, you're better off. Yeah. <laughs> you're better off. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're much faster. The battery life is better. I think for a student, the MacBook Air, the M1 based MacBook Air is the ideal laptop. It's, okay. They're amazing. And with that M1 chip, you know what else you get? What? Better ability to track it if it's ever stolen. Oh, yeah. With Find My Mac. Yeah, you know what? That's a good point. In fact, has he tried? Have you tried Find My Mac on the old one? Yeah, and so he set it to where it's supposed to ping him if they it's offline. Yeah, when they turn it back on. If they're smart, if, they're, if it's a ring of Kansas MacBook th <laughs> thieves then they might know enough to uh, take out the drive and do stuff. But the M1s are much harder mm -hmm. to get around that. Those That's okay. actually another reason to do it. It's much more secure. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Number. Is there a database of stolen, you know, where you can 
plug in the serial number and you should report it to Apple, the stolen uh, MacBook, because yes, if Apple ever sees that pop up for them, they will get they will know in their database, oh, this was a stolen device and they'll be able to okay. to handle it that way. The truth is, bad guys, you should not Yeah, it's not worth it. You should not be stealing any Apple stuff because you probably will not be able to use it again. You might be able to find somebody dumb that can buy it. <laughs> exactly. That's but that but they won't be able to use the it. Extent of so it. it Apple's really done a lot to make it uh, undesirable to steal Apple stuff, whether it's iPhones or Macs. Okay. Good. Good to know. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. well, I hope your son has uh, has a better year this year at Leavenworth U and uh, and things go better. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, that's terrible. It is terrible. It is something I bring up, though, when people um, say, I want to get a laptop for my college student. A desktop's harder to steal. <laughs> that is true. Uh, that you is know, true. And, la and, you know, the other thing is, you got a nice light MacBook Air. You're going to take it to the coffee shop. You're going to take it to class. You're going to put it in your backpack. You're going to carry it around all the time. It's much more likely to get lost or stolen. Yeah. Get him a big, heavy, ugly desktop. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. S something no one would want. Um, yeah, I, that's terrible. And the Xbox, too. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll put a link in the uh, show notes, techguylabs.com, to the Apple page you go to if your Mac is lost or stolen. I forgot about that. I'm glad you remembered that. Apple does keep those. Uh, and, of course, you should report it to the police as well. Mm -hmm. So it's Everyone, on file. Yeah. yeah, everybody should know. But, um, yeah, that's... Um, that's I know sometimes, sad. occasionally, there'll be credit card. If you bought it with a credit card, there are occasionally stolen. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Call, yeah. call the. If they bought it in 2017. It's four years old. Yeah. I think, you know, honestly, it's time for a new one anyway. I think so. Yeah, and the M one. It was are, a gift in the was, end. There's the silver lining. Yeah, it, it was, was a gift. It was a gift yeah, to a have gift. it taken. Yeah. 8888 Ask Leo. Guess what? We've got another gift. This is the show that keeps on giving the Gizwiz. Dick D. Bartolo's coming up. Mad Magazine's maddest writer. He's been with Mad Magazine for five decades. He's going to have a great but cheap and probably useless gadget coming up in just a second. And we'll also tell you how you can win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine from Dickie's collection. Uh, TechGuyLabs.com is the website. Don't forget that because that's open year-round. <laughs> and always available for you. If you hear something on the show, that's where we put the links. And it's free. No sign up. TechGuyLabs.com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's time to say hi to our disco dick, D. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer, and the Gizwiz. Hey, Dickie D., 1978. Wow. That's an old song. Hello, Dickie D. How are you, Leo? I am very well. How are you? Uh, I am good too, thank you. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. How's... Anyway, I sent you some meds, and I included one for Micah. Well, oh, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Postal Service uh, has it, and uh, someday we'll release it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as as I've been saying all day, you usually come by with something inexpensive, but uh, oh, okay, irresistible. Well now, uh, no. <laughs> all right. So, I'll, I'll, all right. All right. So, this Good. is a little backstory to anyway. this. Yes. yes okay. Exactly. So, so, this girl, Sarah uh, Bernard, invented something at age 16. Okay. Yeah. At age 18, got it on Shark Tank. Oh. And now it's on Amazon. So, this is kind of a success, a success story. All right. Yes. But. I, it's main. It's it's for women. For women. And she was afraid of bars, where people would go in and spike drinks. Oh. Okay. Yes. So she invented something called nightcap, that is a scrunchie that women can wear, in their hair, or on their wrist. And then there's a little tab on the scrunchie that you pull on, and the nightcap comes out. Wow. And it's an elastic cover that goes over glasses. I even tried it on some big cups because uh, it, it's supposed to fit pretty much anything, and it does. And then there's a little hole in it so you can put a straw right through the nightcap. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. You know what? I this, think this is. I don't know how big a problem it, it, that is, but this seems like a good solution. It is. It's yeah. No, I, I, absolutely. And, and, and the backstory is, she wanted to do it, and she took uh, her mother's, I think, a pair of pantyhose and started designing it, 
and her brother helped. And then uh, I have to admit the family kicked in. I think she said $18,000 to get it started. This is amazing. But on Shark Tank, she uh, got a $60,000 investment. I hope so, she's making millions. Uh, I, I hope so. Nightcapit.com. So. Right. And I like their slogan, Nightcap. You're covered. <laughs> That's really clever. And it's and the yeah. nice thing is it's just a scrunchie you could wear on your hair until you need it. And then you just, whoop, I got it. And exactly. Right or or on your wrist. And it comes yeah. in different colors. Too. Yeah. So I think I think that's a, I think a, a I'm going to grow a, a ponytail just so I can use this. <laughs> this is great. This is great. Uh, if you want to know more, Dick has a link. And uh, in his own video, by the way, handmade. What do yes, you call it? Right. One take I could, theater. I could wear it on my, one take theater. Yeah. Uh, I could wear it on my mustache because that's the max <laughs> hair I have on my face. You could definitely wear it on your mustache. He's got quite a must, quite a mustache going on. Uh, if that's really, this is a neat story too. I really like the story. Um, if you want to know more, go to gizwiz.biz. That's his website. G i z w i z dot b i z. And uh, there's a link there to uh, the Amazon uh, page, which is good because it can make a little money for Dickie D. He's an Amazon associate. Uh, you can also see his video and you can find out more about it. I think that's a great And you story. can see the January 2022 Mad Cover. Ooh, we're playing for that in the What the Heck Is It yes, contest. Yes, yes. All right. So this is probably the easiest What the Heck Is It contest ever. 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 So How many we, correct we, answers we have you got? Tell I must have 50 already. Okay. Uh, so we're looking for silly crazy. Yeah, there's six autographed Mad Magazines for the right answer. You have to have a drawing, obviously, among the among the correct answers. Yes, exactly. And then there's 18 autographed copies of, I'm sorry, 12. Oh, 12. 12. Yeah. For the, so you have 18 total. 12 for the best wrong answer, but a funniest one. So your best bet at this point is to come up with a clever, you know, like... Uh, Oh yeah, that that's a uh, that's a hot air balloon for cockroaches, <laughs> you know, something like that. That you know yeah. what that that's good. Yeah, that's that might good. win me an autographed copy of Mad that Magazine. That might win you, yeah. and probably you're going to get twenty entries with that now. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, now this is what you're playing for the January. I'm sorry, February edition of Mad Magazine, which uh, has the title "What Me Vengeance," a little Batman with Alfred E. Newman gargoyle. Yeah. And it's all Batman? It's an assortment of, of all Batman stuff. And, oh, nice. you know, I, I, as I said, it, it's stuff from past issues. But I even enjoy looking at stuff I've written in the past because I, I have to it. take off on the Batman animated series. And I forgot that it starts with the animated series is said to be based on the dark, moody Batman movies. Personally, we think it's based on DC Comics' insatiable greed to wring every buck out of the dynamic duo. <laughs> Which, there's some irony was, here. Yes, exactly. Because DC because bought Mad Magazine that, after that. that. DC owns Mad Magazine. They fired, owned them at the time. Fired everybody but two people, moved it to Los Angeles. Yes. So I think this is kind of appropriate. And what's funny is yeah, they still maybe. used it. They still yes. used it. They're, they're still using it. Yeah. That's maybe hysterical. this is why, we're, <laughs> why they fired everybody. That's hysterical. Um, yeah. So That's good. So you've fun. got a parody uh, in there, and I'm sure there are many more. And this, it's uh, you know what? Honestly, Mad Magazine is one of those things where I reread my old mags all the time, and the marginalia and the fun stuff. There's always more to be gleaned from it. It's not one of those magazines like, you know, The New Yorker or Vanity Fair or Time or Newsweek where you read it once and it's now it's it's fish paper. You save your mad magazine. So I don't mind. In a way, it's kind of fun to go back in time yeah, and see all yeah, of Yeah, it, it yeah. is. And the comment, another comment we get endlessly is I read this when I was a kid mm -hmm. and I reread it with the reprints and I thought, whoa, did I miss a <laughs> yes, lot of... Because yeah. it's one of those things where there's stuff yes. at a kid level and then there's stuff for adults that the kid doesn't yes. get. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. I love it. So You have uh, uh, on your website, besides the What the Heck Is It contest plus links to all the things he talks about on this show, you also have links to the things you talk about on ABC's World News Now every month. But you also have... Really good holiday stuff. There's still a few copies left of uh, Dick's memoir, Good Days and Mad, which is a must for anybody who's a fan of Mad Magazine. Anecdotes from the Bill Gaines era. It's just fantastic. 
Uh, and I hope you have another box left of those because uh, I, I have about 20 copies left. Okay, so, so don't wait. But that's that would be an amazing <laughs> gift for somebody who loves Mad Magazine. There's other Mad memorabilia. There's Match Game memorabilia. Dick, for many years, was the head writer on the Match Game game show. Saved it, frankly, uh, from a fate worse than death. He also <laughs> has a Gizwiz garb, little light-up hats and things. There's all sorts of great holiday gifts there. So go to Gizwiz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z dot B-I-Z, and browse around. You'll also find his podcast there, The Gizwiz Show, at gizwiz.tv. Uh, Dick hosts that with Chad Johnson every week. Always fun. Lots more stuff like this uh, all week long. Well, you, thank you. You're very kind. And my, uh, you forgot Mike is a jams and jellies dad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> jams and jellies. And uh, he, he also does these great corn cob dolls. They're just so much Oh, they're great. Oh, Love yeah, those. they're great. Yeah. Yeah, I bought five already. <laughs> Thank you, Dickie D. Have a <laughs> okay, wonderful buddy. week. We'll see you next you time. You too. See you next time. Yeah, yeah. so always, always fun to see. I mean, I grew up reading Mad Magazine. It's, it's been, it was, it was so important in my, in my youth. My ill-spent youth. Leo Laporte and Micah Sargent, the Tech Guys. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guys show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course... The big show every Sunday afternoon, this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.